Well, hello and welcome to a uh, rather different episode of The Cigar Professor. I have decided that tonight we're going to invite all of my, uh, everyone that's on any of my Topher social media, anyone that follows on Facebook, YouTube or Twitter on the Topher social media accounts as well. Hey, why not? Come on in and enjoy an episode of The Cigar Professor. What is The Cigar Professor? Well, I'm glad you asked. The Cigar Professor is where me and uh, two other people who are really unimportant, um, just sort of eye candy, really. I mean, not even. They're just they're actually uglier than me. I don't know. Why do we have more than one cigar? I'm the Cigar Professor, and I'm going to smoke this cigar with all of you and tell you all about it and talk a bunch of crap. And I guess maybe I might let some other people join me as well. Now, this is the Prodomo 10th Anniversary Champagne. It's a Connecticut cigar. This is in the Churchill Vitola. Lovely, lovely looking thing. It's actually the first Churchill that we've had in the Cigar Professor uh, in over 11 packs, which uh, when you stop and think about it, we've been going for a while now. And uh, we haven't been able to afford a Churchill because we used to do weekly cigar smoking episodes. So when people bought a three-month pack, it had 13 cigars in it. So the cigars all had to be smaller. We recently moved to a once-a-month format, and that allowed us to get some proper stonking great big sticks and, uh, and have room in the budget to be able to do that. Well, the person responsible for this stonking great big stick uh, is none other than Professor Damo, and I guess I'm kind of morally obliged to let him join the show. Uh, Damo, how are you? Surviving, surviving on the tail end of a uh, sinus infection, so I'm hoping I've got my uh, a ability to taste tonight. You can't tell I'm a <laughs> well, bit that's... nasally. So. You are you are our super taster, so you being nasally and blocked up is a little bit of a handicap, I've got to say. <laughs> but I'm here. That's the main thing. I've You're here. You are here. here. Now, uh, there's a lot of very confused people. What do we got? We got so we got about over 50 people watching at the moment, um, and many of them will have just stuck their noses in because they thought that Topher was going live with something political, uh, and it's not. It's actually something very much uh, cigar related. Make it political so, if you like. I'm well, we can make it politically, yeah, if you want to. Um, Look, but tell us a little bit about this stick. So, uh, as uh, 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 look, the viewers are probably not aware of this, and 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 our other uh, guest presenter, Omar, is insanely jealous. But when I wooed you as a friend, that I, I lavished my love on you, this was the stick that I wooed you with, was it not? This very this one, this and was, I. This is what won you over. I have to say it worked spectacularly well because here we are some five years later and I'm still tolerating you. Uh, only barely, I will add, but I am tolerating you, which is more than can be said for others. Um, this, this, and it was a memorable stick too. It was a memorable day. We, we went shooting, we had burgers uh, and we smoked this cigar. And I introduced you, I'm going to claim credit for this. I introduced you to having tea, which is what I have accompanying me tonight, with you your cigars. Indeed. That was me. I did that. Yes, you did. All right. Now, so you've mentioned Omar, time. you've mentioned the unmentionable. Um, yes. Do we let him in, do you think? Was he even here? He said he was going to be late. Yeah, I was hoping he'd be even later, but he, unfortunately he has showed up backstage. So I'm kind of, am I obliged to let him in or can I like block him? Well, you're, you're the only one that's got controls of the show. So, I mean, I can't, yeah, I, um, I, I, I'm a libertarian. I don't force anyone to do anything they don't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> Look, about that, I might not be the only one that's got control over the show. I have a, a sneaking suspicion that um, Omar might have spied on me when I was entering my password one time. And um, at any given moment, he could actually just pop up and uh, and really ruin ruin our evening. So, you know what, with that in... Oh, really? <laughs> really? I was just about to say, with that in mind, let's just get started with Adam and enjoy ourselves while we can. But there's the end of that. What's happening? <sighs> Omar, good to see you. How are you? Ah, uh, it's not really see to you. Good to see your ugly face, dude. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah. you're a real charmer. You're yeah. a real charmer. Well, well, he is only here because I saved his skin yet again. How did you have to do it this time? Well, I, 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 I had to provide cigar. him with yet more cigars. Ah, ah, I see. I see. Say no more. Say no more. <laughs> yeah. So gracious you are, Dema. <laughs> and then you can't laugh. Oh. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's better. Back down to the two of us. Topher yeah, has decided to do a disappearing act on us. Yeah, we can. We can he he was having some technical issues at the start of the show. 
Yeah, and, which is, uh, that's why we we're a few minutes late getting started. And I'm still betting that it's because he hasn't got Apple equipment yet. Nah, he hasn't. Don't don't get your hopes up. I am back. <laughs> I am here. I um, the issue is I bought a set of earbuds especially for this moment because after after the debacle, and I will put my hand up and say, look, last month was a bit of a debacle. I didn't have a good time with my technology last month, so I had it all sorted this month. The problem is I got it sorted at the last minute, and the earbuds that I'm supposed to be using right now aren't working. And uh, the phone, when it's using StreamYard, for some reason, won't go into speaker mode. It's strictly using the earpiece. But, of course, my phone has to be in front of me so the camera can see me. And so, unfortunately, you're going to have another another month of, of having goes at me until I come back next month, where it will really, honestly, truly, I promise, all be sorted. Is that is that when you're converting to Apple equipment? No. No, you know when that's happening? The day they bury me underground. That's when that's happening. We can make it happen. Absolutely. I I, I, I understand that you would like to volunteer, Omar, but, but uh, why, and you've probably got all the right Apple skills. We don't even have, you know, Apple branded coffins and we'll bury him in one of those. Yeah, and, and and people would pay. People would pay an absolute fortune for that because people who buy Apple products are stupid. We've established this. <laughs> So uh, often their equipment works. We've got uh, new viewers tonight uh, who probably have not witnessed cigar smoking before. So uh, one of the things to oh. let the new viewers know is that when you get a cigar, generally speaking, not always the case, the end of the cigar that you stick in your mouth has usually got a cap of tobacco over it so that you can't actually draw any air through it. And so you need to use a device called a cutter to cut the uh, tip of the cap off so that you can uh, breathe air through the cigar. Now, this cutter is a little bit unusual. As you can see, it's got a solid back on it. And the concept of that is that you don't cut too much of the cigar off. You really only want to cut a sliver of the cigar off. So I'm going to cut that off. There you go. You can see it's been cut. And if I actually get the piece out, you'll see that it is a very very thin piece of tobacco and that's all that you generally want to take off a cigar just the tiniest mm. sliver and the other thing that you want to do when lighting a cigar is not to rush into lighting it if you light a cigar too quickly what happens is you heat up the tobacco too fast and for the first few minutes of the cigar it will drive off uh, a lot of ammonia based compounds that will give it a harsh bitter flavor so this is my little gas lighter and as you can see, the flame isn't even touching the, um, the cigar. It's just the heat coming off the cigar. You know, like when you hold your hand over a flame, you can only hold it there for so long before it starts to burn. I'm using the same effect to uh, heat the cigar. And then gradually what I will do is when it starts to glow evenly across it, I'll actually start to take a, a few puffs through it. And for those who are not familiar with cigar smoking, cigar smoking is definitely not inhal uh, inhalation of the smoke. I call it wine tasting. So when you taste wine, you in the mouth swish and spit. That's exactly what cigar smoking is all about. It's basically wine tasting of smoke. As you can see, I'm starting to get a nice glow. And you want to make sure you get an even light up to start with so that it burns nice and evenly the whole way. If you get a bad light at the start and don't correct it, you'll be having a bad burn through the entirety of the cigar. And that is quite nutty and toasty right on the light up. <clears throat> One of the other things too with a cigar is the you want the ash to build up as much as possible. The thicker the ash, it insulates the what we call the cherry or the, the piece of tobacco that's burning, glowing red. And the more you insulate it, the less heat that you actually have to um, sort of make it get up to as you draw through to produce the smoke, which means it burns cooler. And the cooler it burns, the more flavor you get. Uh, rather than getting sort of a harsh burnt smoke, you get to taste all these subtle flavors that are 
hidden in the smoke. Well, I've got to say, right on light up, it's exactly what you expect from a Prodomo uh, 10th anniversary champagne. And that was an incredible ring right off the start, Thank right you. at the camera. And right at the camera for a change. I actually got one on target. It's it's quite remarkable. Now, this is this is exactly what you expect from this um, this blend. We know this blend well at the Cigar Professor. We've smoked, I don't know, we wouldn't quite be at every single Vitola, but we'd have to be getting up there by now with a lot of Vitolas. We've done the um, um, Puritos twice. We did the Purito in the first pack as the straight Purito. Then we did the infused version a few packs later that I infused. Mm -hmm. Then we've also done it as a Figurado. Yep. And I don't think we've done it in any other Vitola. This is the... Is that all the, really? Uh, we've had lots of other Podomos, but not this yep. particular one. And yeah, I just right. sort of felt as though we've done the smallest end of the spectrum. We did one that was in the middle. And I thought, well, we might as well go to the other end of the spectrum and uh, see what it is like. Well, it's it's not uncommon for me to actually find a blend that I really like and then find that I actually like it in a smaller Vitola. The yeah. Oliva V Melania being a case in point, and, and I'm such a fan of the Oliva V that when uh, Professor Damo made custom cups for us, he actually picked an Oliva V cigar band to adorn that custom cup. So thank you, Damo, for that. Uh, very well chosen because I am a massive fan of the Oliva V, but it's actually one of the smaller Vitolas that I like the most. And and what happens is you change the the thickness, the ring gauge of a cigar, you'll change the ratio of the fill versus the wrapper, and that changes the flavor profile just a little bit. Then as you change the length, you change how it smokes. And if you, you know, you get a Figurado or something where the, the actual, the, the ring gauge changes over the length of the cigar, that'll change how it smokes again. And I'm quite partial when it comes to just really wanting to enjoy the smoke uh, enjoy the cigar. I'm quite partial actually to the smaller sizes, but this on light up takes me right back to that day when we first met and you offered me one of these. You bribed me with one of these. You bought my friendship with one of these demo. Um, you hit me in my weak spot and uh, I'm reminded of why it worked so well. <laughs> yes. And it, look, it's got a really lovely draw to it. Perhaps a tad on the loose side, Look at that. Look at those rings straight off the cuff. You can't argue like, with a cigar that, that has that many rings built into it. <laughs> Mate, if this thing's going to trip me like this, I'm, I'm already a fan. This is gorgeous. <laughs> it's, it is. It's, it's even smoother and more integrated than the smaller versions of this cigar. I mean, this, it's already a very smooth cigar. That's what the, that's what the blend is. But there's something about, I'm, I'm assuming the length and the filtering effect that happens as the smoke is drawn through such a length of cigar. Um, just gorgeous. I mean, you almost feel like you could just breathe it without, you know, and you, you feel like don't, by the way, but you feel like you could inhale it. There's almost a very, very faint, uh, almost fairy floss type sweetness on that smoke, on the tail end of that smoke that I'm detecting. Without question, without question, an incredibly sweet incredibly sweet smoke so daniel here one of our uh, cigar professor subscribers he's smoking the same cigar tasting note from him walnuts and cinnamon toast the walnuts i'm getting very distinctly that's that i agree with cinnamon toast not quite so much a little bit of toast but i'm not finding for myself in this particular cigar and every cigar is different they're a natural product we don't all, all get the same exact uh tasting notes so i'm not saying that daniel's wrong i'm just expressing what's different about mine I'm not getting much spice. There's no, not even that light bakery spice that we do associate with this blend. You guys? I am finding there's a creaminess there as mm. well. I think if you, you sort of look at it from the fact that we definitely got the, the nuttiness, we've yep. got the toastiness, we've got the yep. sweetness, and got the creaminess, yep. I can actually see where Daniel's getting that cinnamon toast because cinnamon toast, besides the cinnamon flavour, is sort of buttery and toasty as well and sweet yeah. because there's sugar in with the, the the cinnamon that they put on the the cinnamon toast so you know it's it's definitely in that realm of uh, flavor profile now omar yeah can can you shut up please stop talking you're talking way too much you're just you're just taking over the show omar there was a whole lot of a bullshit going on so i thought i must stay away from bullshit tofer i can see you got no palate like i get that but they will try to talk cigar palette while he's got no sinuses. He's fucking acting like he knows what he's talking about. He's got block sinuses, can't smell his own shit. And yet he's, uh, he's talking about cigars. But anyway, um, I think Daniel does have a little bit of point there. I think 
I personally think it has some sort of light sweet spice. I wouldn't know if I call it a spice. Um, it's so sweet, but it's more on the gingerish sort of um, bite to it. Yeah. Yeah. Gingerbread type of bite, but I wouldn't yeah. say cinnamon because cinnamon has more profound flavor. It's more of a gingerbread bread type of bite, and it's absolutely creamy. I, by the way, I agree with Demo. He's right. It's definitely creamy. It's not spicy. It's more of a gingery type of nuance. I, I will want. say, too, is that depending on how hot you got it on the light up, you're more likely to get more of that spice come through if you heat it up a little bit hotter, which is generally with all cigars. If a cigar yes. ever goes out and you relight it, for the first few moments yeah. after you've relit it because you've hit it with a hot flame, you generally get a more spicy flavor coming out of it. So if, uh, if Daniel's been just that little bit hotter in the temperature in his light up than what I have, that would more definitely specific. explain that, that spiciness coming through. Or, or his yeah. own environment and how long he had it out for and all sorts of things. Yeah, at all. how long it's been dry boxed. I didn't yeah. get a chance to dry box mine tonight. It came straight out of the humidor, but it's smoking yeah. absolutely gorgeously. I, I don't yeah. normally dry box, but I actually did mine today. It's it's unusual for me, but I actually did. Um, no idea whether it's made a difference or not, or if it's smoking exactly the same as it would have. But boy, uh, this is a ten out of ten light up. This is as good as it gets. Now, uh, Timothy Armstrong, Tim, good to good to see you again. I uh, haven't caught up for a while. Um, says never had a great experience with Prodomo. Shut your ears, Domo. You're gonna, you're gonna, you don't want to. This is blasphemy. I'm, I'm devastated that he's he's had such a bad run with Prodomo because, look, hand on my heart, I have had two Prodomos in my lo lifetime of cigar smoking that have not been great. Uh, one of them was with Omar. Um, right. But that being said, I have generally found when I've had problems with other cigars and have got very frustrated and just in the mood for an easy smoking cigar. And there's been a few occasions when I've had a ridiculously expensive cigar that I've just been unable to smoke and I've tossed it in the bonfire or thrown it away. The next cigar I've grabbed has always been a Podomo. And I've, you know, apart from two incidences I've had, I've had one, one uh, incident of tunneling and I had one incident that I had to relight it. But on mm. both of those occasions, once I corrected the problem, I was able to still smoke it uh, without too much drama. Um, Podomo yeah, provide Tim, themselves I... on the amount of testing they do to try and make sure that they alleviate sending out any bad bad sticks. So, um, now, so Tim, you've you got to understand. To to me direct, uh, send us a message. Um, I wouldn't mind finding out like where he's su supplying from, getting them from, and how he's storing them, and. Maybe we can work out, you know, where the problem is that so we can get some yeah. good quality Podomos. Now, Tim could be forgiven for not believing you because everyone knows that you are Nick Podomo's uh, girlfriend. Mm. Um, so, well, look, uh, but Tim, it, I will it, actually, it, 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 I will. Many layers. I mean, apart from <laughs> cars, Podomo and the hoodie, it's also the shirt as well. So, so and, and your opinions and, are and, obviously and, completely and unbiased. And, and it's lighter. <laughs> Um, so Tim, a slightly a slightly more neutral viewpoint would be mine, uh, but I, I it hurts me to say this, but I actually agree with Damo. Um, they tend to be very very well constructed, actually probably better than the average across the non-Cuban industry, and the non-Cubans tend to be better than the Cubans. So even amongst the non-Cubans, they tend to be at the better end of the scale for construction. So you've either had a really bad run, or quite possibly more likely, the supply chain through which you're getting them is causing them to either dry out at some point or to have other storage issues that are translating into smoking issues when you get them. So there, there may be a supply chain issue there. Mm. Cigars are incredibly finicky, and it's just one of those things that has to be looked after perfectly from start to finish. Otherwise, you will end up with issues. And, and look, some cigars are more finicky than others. You know, some cigars like to sit at 68% humidity and burn perfectly well. Other cigars at 68% percent humidity find it's too moist and you have burn yeah. issues with them and you drop it down to 65 and they burn perfectly well yeah so and, and that's only three percent change yeah. in humidity it makes a world of difference i would i would say i think i think Topher raised a good point i mean they more raised a really good point um perdomo cigars I've, i don't remember having a bad perdomo um like horrible construction where you can't smoke it but I think what I find really, really fascinating is that they will make the point that, <clears throat> that the Perdomo test their cigars in terms of the mm. testing part more than others. And that actually occurred when he used to spend a lot of time under Nick Perdomo's table 
So the testing was happening underneath the table. So he counted yeah. every time he, he tested a cigar, he held on to it, tested it, shaked it a few times. Yep, 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 yeah. yep. No, no, no. Uh, so but, perfect. But it gets even better than that because I've heard it from a reliable source uh, yeah. that Damo was trained in his cigar quality control um, yes. by, oh, what was what was her name? Uh, she's, she's one of the best. In the, uh, Monica Lewinsky, that's right, um, yes. is the yeah. one who trained <laughs> Demo in how to do the under desk quality uh, control, look, and, with, and that's why he's respect. so good at it. That's why Nick um, just Lewinsky's really his quality control with cigars. My understanding was deeply based with Gurkha, and we know that uh, Omar's the Gurkha fanboy here. So yeah, yeah, but we'll stick to we'll stick to the testing uh, under the <laughs> table. <laughs> so guys, quite a slow burn. Um, it's yeah. not in a hurry to burn at all. It's quite happy, just smoking away. Reasonable burn line, not quite razor sharp, but pretty good and certainly no indication for me that it's going to give me any trouble at all. Seems like I've got a good one. It's breathing well, breathing very freely. You guys? Yeah, look, it's a slightly loose, to... loose draw. Do loose draw? Me? Okay. Slightly loose draw, yeah. Slightly, not by much. It's still good, but slightly loose draw. But it's going really good for me. I'm loving the flavors. Absolutely yeah. loving the flavors. Even the foot smoke is, man. Isn't it it's beautiful? Awesome. Just a beautiful cigar in every regard. Very mild. You've got to pair it with very mild drinks. You can't, if you've had chili for dinner, you're probably not going to want to smoke this cigar because you just won't taste anything. Um, but, you know, I've, I've got black tea uh, to pair it with, and I've got um, just a, a good sort of mid-range uh, whiskey that I've got here on hand. Just a, It's just a blend, nothing, nothing fancy. I uh, haven't even started on that yet. I'm better do that. Um, and if you just keep it simple in the drinks department, the flavor of the cigar really shines. Sorry, Omar. Yeah. Pre-breakfast stick, I will call this. Well, look, you would call any cigar a pre-breakfast stick. Literally, <laughs> before you've gotten out of bed, your hand is fumbling around beside the bed looking for the humidor. You find whatever cigar your hand lands on is your pre-breakfast cigar. Yeah, but in all honesty, it's a very mild. Um, very mild. Very mild. Uh, mild doesn't mean good or bad, to be honest. It's what mood you're in just and what you like, what's your taste. Beautiful ring there. That was Thanks. just great hitting the camera, man. That was good. Tori, you're killing some rings today, man. Get, getting a few of them tonight. It's nice. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh, I'm I'm waiting for Omar to just to reach into his beard and pull out a cigar. <laughs> You'd be surprised. <clears throat> uh, Doris, I'm sorry to be giving you a hard time. It's not my intention. Go and have a good night. Do something else for the evening. And uh, and when you're ready, come on back. But um, look, today's not a normal tofu cigar slow chat anyway. We're not doing politics. Tonight. I mean, we may. We may stray over to politics at some point. But that's not the point. We're, we really are here. We do this every month. These are the cigar professors. This is Omar. This is Damo. And uh, my tofu, obviously, you know who I am. Uh, and this is something that we do every month. So, um, yeah. Feel free once you uh, once you spend a bit longer off the ciggies. Uh, feel free to drop by when we do uh, when we do more in future. Yeah, it's a good that's a good whiskey, Daniel. It's it's a good whiskey for this kind of a cigar, nice and mild. Um, you know, it's not going to get in the way. It's not obnoxious. Sorry. Nope, I'm imagining things. Okay, not the first time. I'm finding that nuttiness is actually transition from the walnut i'm thinking it's going a little bit more like a toasted almond now something a little bit cleaner okay. less earthy in the nutty okay. flavor if anything i'd say for me what's happening is there's just a little tiny bit of fresh celery that's crept in to the back and that's freshened up the overall profile yep. but i wouldn't say it's changed what was already there it's just there's another flavor stream that's come in and it's shifted the balance the other flavors are still there but there's something that's now starting to compete with it a little bit well um, i I'll can't hear a word you're saying <laughs> that's the best way to have him isn't it that's the most intelligent thing he's ever said yeah <laughs> steven Fantastic. now here's the thing steven made a very very Good note there. I think it is probably the most accurate thing of uh, – that's my palate. I think he's speaking from my palate directly. Because cedar just popped in. There was always a shortbread. I think that's kind of mixed up with cedar. 
I'm not talking about the nuts stuff that you guys are talking about. Someone has nuts in their mouth. I don't know who. But <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I think Stephen is on the money. He's absolutely on the money. It's it's creamy with a, with a mild spiciness, which is called a ginger. And it's a showbread biscuit with, with a touch of cedar in it. It's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, Demo, maybe your sinus is a block. You're just getting nuts in your eyes, head somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> well, you're a real charmer, Ima. No wonder where you're only friends. <laughs> I tell you what. Oh, sorry, did I call us friends? Oh, dear. <laughs> How to opt out before you do? Um, no, but Stephen had like very, very good. That's 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 great, Stephen. You're right, Daniel. I was thinking about this earlier today. We still haven't done bingo. We need to do our uh, cigar tasting note bingo at some yeah. point. Yes. What are we up to now? We've blasted past our second birthday. Yes, we must yeah. be getting not that far from our third birthday. That's terrifying. Yeah, end of this year. I'm going to have to work out what, what stick we're going to do for that one. Yeah. All right. Well, you work on what stick we're going to do. Uh, Omar and I will collaborate on um, on some cigar, uh, some cigar tasting night bingo to oh, enjoy yes. to send out with the next pack and enjoy for our third birthday for the cigar professor. Ooh, no, that'd be something. Hi, right, David. David, just hey, up. David. It's been a while since we've uh, at least yeah. since I've uh, spoken to you on the show. Well, David had uh, had the gall to go and sail around South America and enjoy himself without the rest of us. Um, so and I'm still a bit cigars, offended by I'm that, sure. to be honest. I'm not sure if I really want him on the show. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, David's a good man. Uh, uh, but I do actually, I agree with this tasting note here. The 10th anniversary range has been consistently good. I agree. Everything in the 10th anniversary range, I am a fan of. The Connecticut more than the rest, but nevertheless, the rest is still very good. The estate selection, absolutely, 100%. We had one Prodoma that none of us liked a lot. I can't find it in my notes. Was it in the 20th anniversary I range? think it was the 20th anniversary Majuro. Yeah. Yeah, um, yep, I agree. We did a comparison between the 10th and the 20th. Yes. Um, the 20th anniversary, we haven't tried the sun growing all the Connecticut in that range. The interesting thing is last week at the um, uh, cigar trade show in America, Podomo launched their 30th anniversary cigars for 30 years of being in business. I saw and, that. Um, so at some point in the future, we'll be experimenting with the 30th anniversary range as well and see what they're like. Maybe we do a three pack where we get the 10th, the 20th and the 30th in a Connecticut, perhaps. I just, I, I, I don't know. I just, the 10th to the 20th, the 10th is consistently better because we haven't done them necessarily with the Cigar Professor, but I've had the 20th anniversary Connecticut. I've mm. had the 20th anniversary Sun Grown. And I would pick the 10th every single time. So I don't know. Is the blender getting worse with age? You know, is yeah. he, is he you know, <laughs> losing his senses? He's gone senile. He can't taste anymore. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what's going on, but I would pick the 10th over the 20th every time. I would say the only thing that I like about the 20th is... <laughs> It is tightly packed, more tightly packed. It lasts a bit longer. That's true. It's, it lasts a bit longer, more bang for your buck, and it's a bit more deeper smoke. So I'm a, I'm a little bit like in that, that 20th, particularly Maduro. Then when I had a couple, I think it's it's an absolutely gorgeous smoke. I mean, I can't separate them. In tent, I probably go for the Connecticut more in the tent. I've got oh, a very tenth Connecticut is, is among the best Connecticut's you can get at a, at a reasonable price however, point. However, now Steve made a very interesting point. He's he's like, oh, dude. I've got to say about that straight up, straight up. If oh, fuck, this is a tough one. This is a very tough one. Are you going to say right. something sooner or later, or are you just going to sit there just correcting yourself and stop <laughs> starting for the next half hour? I love Perdomo Tenth Connecticut. And he's trying to compare the Connecticut with the Monte Cristo White. Now, again, being cigar stingy, Monte Cristo White is uh, more of a more tobacco hit. It's more slightly more bolder, and it lasts a bit longer. 
That's why I like yeah. a little bit touch more. That's my answer. Look, the, the Monte Cristo white is a great stick. We've had it for three Christmases in a row. Uh, it was our it was our Christmas stick in our first year, our Christmas stick in our in our second year, and we're in our third year now. We haven't reached the end of it yet, so we're not three years old, but. We've actually had a Monte Cristo white three years in a row, and they were all from the same batch. So they were getting one year older as we went along. Each yeah. time we came back to it with another year of aging added to that cigar, it just got better and better and better. It is truly one of the outstanding yeah. um, Connecticut's, but it's not, I, it, I, I don't think of it as a true Connecticut. This is a true Connecticut. The Ave yeah. Maria Immaculata is a true Connecticut. Um, you know, there are others that, 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 that you're like, yes, it's a Connecticut wrapper, but they've used something bolder in, um, in, in, the, in the binder or they've used something bolder in the filler uh, that, that, has, that gives it that extra little level up. And that's, you know, something like a Lot 23, the Prodomo Lot 23, something like the, the 3 by 3s by Davidoff uh, and something like the Monte Cristo White, I would all put into that kind of a category. Yes, technically they're a Connecticut, but there's something else in there that adds that extra layer of boldness. So they're not a true Connecticut. I don't, they're not truly comparable, I don't think. Uh, but if I had to reach for one or the other, me personally, most of the time, but not every time, I would reach for this one. Yep. I'd agree. It's also a great stick if someone's new to uh, yeah. smoking. This is a yeah. great stick to start them on. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> I mean, look at that. Look at the way that ash is just stacking up. It's just yeah, perfect. This is a great question. This is a very, very worthy question worth uh, worth us discussing for a little while. I had one or two of these with the lads and I like them. What are some good entry-level cigars? Well, there's really there's two things. One is the right cigar. Two is the right supply chain. Uh, because you can get a good cigar from a corner shop tobacconist who doesn't know what they're doing, hasn't kept the temperature right, hasn't kept the humidity right. And you light it up yeah. and it's just like you're smoking ash all the way through, even though it was a good quality cigar. Um, 100%. So there's really this kind of two parts to that. I just got to interrupt you very quickly. I, I What Topher said is is just gold because I lost my cigar. I was away in Queensland about Angel Share and I had to chuck it. Now, anyone and oh, everyone who knows about cigars. Are you kidding me? Yeah. They know that Angel That's an Share expensive is stick. Of, it's an expensive stick. And I couldn't finish it. I had to chuck it. So please continue to offer. I just want to quickly add that in it. What you said is just gold because you can have a good cigar, but it's super important. You want to spend where you where you want to spend your money. Yeah, yeah. Okay. For me, for me, there's really three just absolute automatic yes, try that as, as a beginner. One is exactly the cigar we happen to have tonight. It's a it's a sophisticated enough blend that it's still good. For, um, for experienced smokers like us. That's why we're smoking it tonight. But this is the Prodomo 10th anniversary in the Connecticut, otherwise known as a champagne is what they call it in, in Prodomo speak, um, in pretty much any Vitola, Vitola being the word for size. Any size, any shape of this blend is going to be a really beginner-friendly stick, but also have depth and complexity and interest for someone who, you know, who might want something a bit more complicated or something, someone who's a bit more experienced. The other go-to for me would be the Ave Maria Immaculata. Uh, now, that that was actually literally the very first cigar that we ever smoked together on The Cigar Professor, and there's a reason why we picked that one to be the very first. It's an incredibly inviting, welcoming beginner's cigar. You can you can mm. smoke that one, uh, and it's it's going to treat you really well. The other one that I would add, because the the, the, the Prodomo and the, the Ave Maria aren't necessarily going to be readily available if you're going to a tobacconist or, or you know, looking around online, there's not, not everyone has them. We do, of course. We can supply them. But if you're looking around elsewhere... Um, you know, the the uh, the Davidoff range is a pretty good range. Now, they've got a distinct kind of flavor of their own. The Davidoff range is just a little bit distinct. Anyone that's an experienced cigar smoker knows the Davidoff range is just kind of a slightly separate thing, but it's very beginner friendly. Their construction quality is very, very good. The flavor is is mm. good. Um, Absolutely. And uh, the, the only downside is you, you're going to pay a little bit more for a Davidoff. The uh, only thing they add to it is another one you could add to that list. Nub Connecticut, yes, yeah, I'd forgotten that. Yeah, Good. yeah. The only thing I would say, I think it's it's not really a lot about what you get, but as long as you get someone who looked after the cigar, is far more important. Now well, that's a good ring. That's a heavy duty ring. Um, I would also quickly add that if if you get hold of, I mean, I'm not a big fan of Cuban cigars, as everyone knows, and I don't, you know, hide it. I don't think they Cubans make good cigars. 
in general. Um, but Hoya de Montre and small Monte Cristo sizes can also be very pleasant to have. Um, I think they they within the Cuban range, small Monte Cristos and Hoya de Montres, they're very nice startup cigars. Uh, very enjoyable indeed. Julie has asked pretty much the million dollar question that splits the cigar smoking world in half. <laughs> Um, and you can't wade into this question without getting hate from one direction or another. Um, yeah, given that I do know there's quite a few sort of um, curious cigar smokers or, or beginner cigar smokers that are watching at the moment, it's worth kind of commenting on that. Um, do the best cigars come from Cuba? Well, according to the Cubans, of course, the answer is yes. Um, and I would say the cigars with the most history and the cigar brands with the most history will, will come from Cuba. Everything that's non-Cuban is referred to in the industry as New World. So there's Cuban cigars and there's New World cigars. Those are the those are kind of the categories. And at the Cigar Professor, we've smoked, we, we had some packs that were dedicated, or a pack that was dedicated to Cuban cigars. We've had a few Cuban cigars along the way elsewhere. And, you know, we've actually come to the conclusion through literal trial and error and smoking and, and sharing and, and listening to other people's thoughts and feedback and looking at what they cost and looking at how many construction issues we have with them and how well they smoke. Honestly, I default to New World cigars now. I default away from Cuban cigars. There are occasions where I'll, I'll, I'll have a Cuban and I'll want a Cuban, and, and that's always a little bit special. It's always, you do feel like you've, oh, it's a Cuban. Like there is that still that perception, whether it's real or not, it's kind of secondary. There is that perception still. Um, but if I just want to know that my money is going to go on something that's going to smoke well and taste good, uh, I'll actually go for a New World cigar almost every single time. A hundred percent, and I... We look, I've smoked thousands of cigars. I smoke a lot of cigars. I love Cuban cigars and I've smoked a thousand dollar, twelve hundred dollar cigar, Cuban cigar. I would say this though, some of the best cigars I've ever had, uh, and they will witness two of them, a Monte Cristo and a Wild Churchill. They were both Cubans. The yeah. top of the tree really is a Cuban cigar, but you're gonna chase that for thousands of cigars to get that cigar. And if yeah. you have millions of dollars spare or you have this inner thing that say, I'm going to find a Cuban cigar, go for it. Yeah. You know, otherwise, every day you want to enjoy a cigar. You don't want to be angry about it. You simply want yeah. to follow the tradition of cigar. Then you got to go New World Cigar. Simply one, put. One of the biggest problems with Cuban cigars is they're a product of their own success. They are so successful that they no longer have to put any effort into the quality of what they manufacture or any care into what they're producing. And so they will produce as much as they can, as quick as they can, as cheap as they can, because they will get top dollar for it. Yeah. And there's no incentive to improve on that because there will always be someone willing to pay the money to buy the cigars. Yeah. And the demand has outstripped supply for Cuba. And yeah. so... What you find is with a lot of the other New World cigars, they have to focus on the quality and the experience of the smoke in order to compete with the brand name and the brand image of Cuban cigars. And so they're putting a lot more time and effort into the thought of the flavor and the, how it burns and how it changes and to pro provide you with a box of cigars where you can smoke every single cigar in that box and not have a problem. Now, with the Domo cigars, I've probably gone through in the last five, ten years, probably about four or five boxes of just Podomos, which is probably about 100, 150 cigars. And I've only had two problems with that. I can mm. honestly say with every box of Cuban cigars that I've dealt with, I've had no less than four cigars per box that's had a problem. And mm. I haven't smoked every cigar in that box either. Mm. And yeah. um, hey, hand on my heart, the best one or two cigars I think I've ever smoked, Cuban probably the worst 10 or 20 cigars I've ever smoked, has smoked Cuban as well. So yeah. generally speaking, I've found that I've had more issues and more burn problems with Cuban cigars. And this is a problem for new smokers because new smokers look at this incredible brand image and reputation that the Cuban cigars have got. And then they get into cigar smoking and have all these issues and they can't understand what's going on. And they don't realize that it's the cigar and they think that it's themselves or it's too difficult or it's not as pleasant or not as enjoyable activity as as what they were hoping it was going to be. Whereas if they had started off with the, uh, one of these or the Ave Maria Immaculata or the the Nub Connecticut, they would have just had an incredible experience straight off the cuff and and, and really just realised, you know, it's not as bad as it could, be, you know, 
the experience has been yeah. in Cuba. And speaking of Cubans, you know, it's a very relevant thing to ask by Fred. Mm. Question for the table. I can't read it. Demo, can you read it for me, man? No, my camera's in the way. Uh, <laughs> so it's going to have to read it for me. <laughs> well, look, Fred, Fred, you know, you ask a very relevant question because I used to think so, and I was quite proud of that. Uh, and then um, when I met Demo, I realized I had competition. And uh, maybe maybe <laughs> Tofus weren't the biggest assholes. Um, and then, then Damo introduced me to Omar, and I, I just have to bow to his to his greater <laughs> expertise. Um, so what I would say is probably the, the world's biggest assholes are named yeah. cigar professors. That's probably the conclusion that I'm coming to. Yeah, that's probably right. That's not my <laughs> <laughs> uh, No comment. For legal reasons, no comment. No comment. Listen, I'm actually finding myself really, really tempted to actually ash this. Now, I know it would probably hold on for another half an inch or more, um, but I'm in my studio and I just don't feel like having ash all over the floor. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm really struggling here, guys. I know we normally have an unofficial ash challenge and every time Omar wins, he lords it over us for the following month. Every time he loses, he sooks. Um, and I always enjoy that. But I'm just, I just don't want to drop this ash all over my desk or all over my computers. Tofer. Seriously, man. Well, that's where I'm at. Well, I already bumped. You've already dropped it. yours, Omar. You can't talk <laughs> shit. No, nah, I, I the demo dropped, dropped it way before. He was the first yeah, one. Yeah, I, 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 I accidentally jarred my cigar and dropped it before. So, oh, yeah. Wait, so you're We're telling me that I've already won the Ash Challenge so effortlessly that I didn't even notice. <laughs> I didn't say anything. You are useless. <laughs> wow. Just wow. <laughs> well, yeah, we're giving you all the comments on the rings. You know, what? didn't want to inflate your ego too much. And there it goes, right on my desk. Uh, there you go. Fun. Better on the desk than on the floor. <laughs> well, that answers that question. I guess I'm getting ash on my desk. <laughs> That's a demo question. Uh, he's talking about Nick Perdomo. <laughs> I thought he was talking about Daniel Andrews. <laughs> oh, no, this, this is for demo for Nick All right. Perdomo. So a lot of people, particularly new cigar smokers, are going to wonder why there's so many different size cigars. And apart from the flavor differences, as Topher alluded to before, the, the, the ratio between the outer wrapper and the fill makes the flavor change. Um, the size is predominantly based on how much time you've got. This is a, a, a one and a half hour stick. Whereas yeah. if Easy. you've only got, say, 20 or 30 minutes, you'd probably want to sm smoke one of the little Puritos, which is probably about the size of your ring finger in size. Oh, not um, even. Probably maybe your pinky. pinky. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and sort of um, I don't as think you go up in size, you, you basically increase the <laughs> amount of time that you've got to smoke that cigar. But as far as how far you go down in America – Generally speaking, because cigars are so ridiculously cheap and there's next to no tax on their cigars, they smoke to the van, they put it down, and that's the end of it. They but, literally smoke to sort of here-ish, and they'd leave all of that, all of this, they would just put in the ashtray and they'd pick up another one. Yep. Stuart, no one asked you. No one asked you, Stuart. You? No one asked you. You're not in the challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just, just hide that com comment. Um, <laughs> Why? Like he's, he's got the ash, man. Let it be. <laughs> Losers, no. man. But no. in Australia at the moment, uh, the tobacco tax is $1,754 a kilogram or $1.74.5 per gram for t tobacco tax. That's on top of the cost and shipping. And then on top of that, they add GST and customs duty. And because of that, a cigar like this has around about probably about $33, $35 worth of tax on it. And so because there's so much expense in cigars in Australia, what you generally find is Australian cigar smokers will generally, what they say, smoke right down to the nub. So they'll literally smoke it down until there's nothing left to hang on to without burning their fingers. And um, that's just general practice in Australia just because they're so expensive and it's, uh, you know, it's a luxury. You can't afford to be throwing away, you know, $10, $15 worth of cigar, um, 
like you could in America where it would only be worth 50 cents or a dollar. I think the yeah. bottom line is you could go as until you enjoy it. It's simple answer. When yeah. you feel like you can't, you're not enjoying it after you bellow it, which is to clean the cigar, you, you push some air through it. Uh, if it's still going harsh on you, you just put it down, you retire it. That simple as that. Yeah. And this is potentially one of the stings in the tail that can come with your really big sort of cigars, your, especially your really long cigars. As you smoke a cigar, you're obviously you're drawing the smoke from the, the, the front of the cigar into the, the, the base of the cigar. And over time, what that can lead to, depending on the blend, how you how fast you smoke and you know how much humidity is in the atmosphere, there's all sorts of variables. But what you can end up with is actually quite a lot of tar and quite a lot of sort of um, smoke byproducts being trapped in the tobacco down the back here, which means that once that burn line actually gets all the way down to that, you can end up with a cigar that really turns on you, that can get really nasty. And it can often be quite sudden. You'll be smoking, you'll be enjoying it and thinking, oh, this is still good. And then two puffs later, all of a sudden, you're like, ugh, like what has just happened? And what's happened is you've you've got to the part of the cigar that was trapping all of the, you know, you remember when we lit this up, where I, was, I was commenting on just how incredibly smooth it was. Well, that was in part because of the filtration effect of all of the other tobacco capturing some of the other nasties on the way down. That then comes back to haunt you as you try and smoke it all the way to the nub. So a cigar like this, that's this long, a Churchill, I would not expect to be able to smoke it all the way to the very end without it turning on me. It's it's probably going to turn at some point in that last inch or so towards the end. And at that point, I'm just going to throw it away and just say, thank you very much. That was a great cigar. I'm not going to try and smoke it beyond the point where it turns on me. Whereas a shorter Vitola, like a Nub, so there's a brand of cigar called Nub, uh, made by the Oliva uh, factory, actually, which is my personal favorite um, brand of cigar. And, and they're only this long to start with. And with something like that, you'll smoke it all the way down to the very end till it's burning your lips and you're still like, no, 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 keep going, keep going, don't stop. It hasn't turned on you because it hasn't had that length to be capturing all of the tar and everything else all the way through. So it's personal preference. It's the specific Vitola of cigar that you've got. And ultimately what it comes down to is if you're enjoying it, you're right. If you're not enjoying it, you're right, right? If, if a cigar tastes good, you're right. If it tastes bad, you're right. Okay, you do what you enjoy. Another thing on that note, too, is generally speaking, in much colder conditions, and also particularly when there's a lot more moisture in the air, you generally find that that transition uh, to that harshness can often kick in earlier. That sort of cold, damp air tends yeah. to cause more of those tars to build up and precipitate out sooner. And uh, you'll often, in colder weather, not be able to smoke a cigar down as far as you would, as you say, in the middle of summer where it's a nice, warm, balmy night. That's just from my own experience. <clears throat> There's a few people just jumping in and uh, commenting uh, an awful lot. Someone's just punching in a bunch of names. I've no idea why. Uh, <laughs> If you're yeah, this is actually a good point. If you're new, remember not to smoke the label. Uh, the label, the band comes off. Yep. Uh, we like to leave the band on until the burn has almost reached the band. And the reason we do that is because the warmth of the smoke will actually soften. There's like a gum that they use to, to affix these bands on there. And the warmth of the smoke and so forth will just soften that a little bit, make it a bit easier to get it off with minimal risk of actually damaging the cigar itself. You can take it off before you even light the cigar up. Lots of people do do that. But I think if you want to do that, you've got to exercise just an extra level of care. I mean, at this point now, this is even just loose sitting here, right? So I know that thanks to the warmth that's come through this already and just loosened it off, it's going to come off the cigar without causing any damage at all. So we tend to leave the band on for as long as we can. But remember, do not smoke the label. That smoke is also definitely, uh, the texture of that smoke has developed a slight thickness, a little bit of chewiness to that, that texture. It, it's still a smooth smoke, but it's almost got a sticky texture to it now. I would, I would say it's notably less smooth than it was. I still agree it's in the smooth category. But yep. the smoke, the foot smoke in that open, in that first, not even first third, that first half of a third was some of the sweetest, lightest most delicate cigar smoke you're ever gonna you're ever gonna find anywhere now it's still very light it's still very smooth 
it's still a lovely a lovely atmosphere that it's created here in the studio um but that first that first little bit is almost like magical well if we were Renault Rivkin you'd light the first bit you'd smoke it you'd put it down you'd walk somewhere else into the next room pick up the next one and light up and start again <laughs> he was renowned for starting cigars every time he changed rooms Mate, I would love to have been his housekeeper because I'd just be taking <laughs> taking all of these mostly unsmoked cigars, just snip off the bit that he smoked and just get on with it. <laughs> I can't believe how many rings you found in that cigar. Look, whoever rolled this cigar, I'm a fan of, of that cigar roller. I just want to have exclusive access to all of their cigars. Uh, because they, they roll an enormous number of rings into their cigars, which is always nice. Oh, no. Stuart, what happened? Tight draw, really? So a perfect draw, for those that don't know, a perfect draw is this tool here. Actually, let me just let me move things around and get it so that people can see what I'm doing here. There we go. So a perfect drawer is this tool here. And what it does is it's like a, like a spike, but on one end of the spike, it's got some barbs. I'll get it in front of my face. Hopefully you can see that. It's got some barbs. And what you're able to do is if you get a cigar that's a bit plugged, and this happens mostly with Cubans, but it does happen with every cigar, as it sounds like it's happened with Stewart's, you would actually insert that into the, the, the mouth of the cigar and twisting it lots and lots and lots and then pulling it out, bringing out little shards of tobacco with it. And you do that as often as is needed and you go as far as is needed, bringing it out regularly just to clear out any tobacco that it's kind of cut. Um, and that way you can get a cigar that might be too tightly packed or perhaps is a little bit too humid. Um, obviously, the more humidity is absorbed by the tobacco, the more tight it becomes, the less airflow is allowed through. Uh, and that's why something like a perfect draw exists. Uh, in order to, to repair something like that and get it so that you can um, you can still smoke a cigar. Because once you've lit a cigar, you don't want to then stop smoking it and put it back in your humidor or try and come back to it, you know, more than a few hours later. I mean, if you have to, okay, yeah, a few hours, okay, fine. Um, but I, I avoid having to relight a cigar the following day, like the plate. I just, I'll sit up to whatever time it takes to finish it that same night because it's just not the same. Um, and so if you light up a cigar and then you discover, hang on, this is too humid, it's too tightly packed, I need to dry this out a little bit, you can't just dry it out and dry box it for a few days and come back to it because it'll just taste horrid. So that's where something like this comes in to just clear a bit of a path for a bit of airflow and you can smoke it um, straight away. So, Stu, sorry to hear that's happened. Um, that's a little bit unusual with, with a Prodoma. Um, also because yeah, cigars are handmade, what, what... literally hand-rolled, what can happen is they, they actually form the inner leaves of tobacco into tubes. And sometimes if the tubes get a little bit of a twist on them as they're rolling them up, that can cut off um, the channel that the air flows in. And so what that uh, perfect draw tool does is it just basically punches through the little kink in the, the tobacco leaves and produces a, a little corridor for the air to flow again. Yeah, yeah. All right, here's a good question. Top five Connecticut's. I think we've already mentioned probably three of them. That would be this we've one. The, three. Uh, Prodoma. Sorry? We've already mentioned three. Prodoma 10th anniversary, Ave Maria Immaculata, Nub, Connecticut. Yep. What would you add to, to round that out to five? I think uh, Gurkha Chairman Select or Drew State. That's, that's, not, not, Connecticut. that's not really a Connecticut, though. That's more of a, uh, a natural wrapper. Isn't it? It's a it's yeah, a brilliant it's a cigar. Enough. You you're right. It's it's one of the few Gurkhas that I do actually rate. I, I don't rate Gurkha overall, but that's an exception. But I I wouldn't put that in the Connecticut category at all. Underground um, Shade is another one that I really like. That's a good one. Yeah. 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 The Underground Shade. You know, um, Southern Draw Rosa Sharon. Yeah. Yes. Actually. Movie. Actually, you know what? Yes. Now that you mention it, I was going for what's the leaf by Oscar? Yeah, yeah. They don't have anything called a Connecticut. They've got the yeah, um, Connecticut. It was called a Connecticut, was it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm just trying to think back because we've had every single cigar in their range over the over the last two and a half years. You like the Sumatra okay. the most? 
the I like the Sumatra, the Corojo and the Sumatra were the two that, that really got me. Um, but I'd, I'd say that's another that's another really good Connecticut. That's that's in more of a now, mind you, the Room One Hundred One farce. That wasn't bad. Yeah, yeah, that was the flavor Maduro profile. Rapper, the One Hundred One, the farce. Lon, the that was the, that was the one that we had Maduro. in the um, in the Lonsdale Vitola. That was a Maduro that was the rapper. second. Really, that was the second cigar we ever had. Yeah. Uh, it was either a Maduro or a natural, but it's a dark wrapper. Mm, and we're gonna have to we're gonna have to go back to the uh, the instant replay on that one. I'm gonna go back to the episode and uh, and have a I'll look. Tell you like, what, I don't have any in my humidor. It was a Connecticut that we all did like was the three by three, which was the budget line mm. of David off. Yeah, the three by three tubos were, were a great cigar. Um, and we can't go this far into a list without mentioning uh, again the Monte Cristo White. It's it's a fabulous fabulous yeah. cigar. Uh, so there you go. There's more than five, but probably I'd, I'd say it's easier to list a top three. All right, top five gets harder. Top three, this one, the Nub Connecticut, and the Ave Maria Immaculata. Yeah, yeah. that that Ave Maria Immaculata. That's an that's almost a fail safe go to for me, and particularly it's... if I'm with someone who's not a seasoned cigar smoker who only has maybe a couple of year and just wants a smooth, easy smoke. Um, it's, and particularly if they're after one that's a long smoke, like they, they're going to sit down with me and have a one to two hour sit around a campfire and have a smoke yeah. with me. I'll usually pull yeah. one of those out because they can, um, it, it's, it's a lot less taxing on the palate. And mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking, it's also a, a, a lighter strength uh, cigar as well. Yeah. And so they'll usually get yeah. through that quite easily. Whereas if I pulled out a, a heavier cigar, they probably only get oh. halfway through it and they'll have... You pull out a Monte out. Cristo white on someone who only has a few a year and they're going to turn green halfway through. It's, yeah. it's just too much. Um, so actually, what I'm up here... I've well, turned green on a Monte white once. <clears throat> Mind you, I was dehydrated and just finished chainsawing down a tree and chopping it up and I was totally exhausted, dehydrated and decided it was worthy of a cigar. And... Um, yeah, I went definitely went green on that. I couldn't even walk uh, Omar, straight up and fell over. Omar, did that just did that just sound like a bunch of weak ass excuses to you? Yeah, very weak. <laughs> they, they, they say weak as piss. <laughs> well, speaking same. of piss, um, the get wrecked here, right? Is asking uh, what am I pairing it with? Well, I've got black tea. Uh, I think it's a great go-to. I have black tea with basically every cigar I smoke. I think it's just a fabulous way of keeping the palate wet, uh, dealing with any dryness that may kick in, uh, and the flavor profile of it. Just a basic black tea. This is the cheapest Coles or Woolies black tea that you can get. It's like four cents a bag. It's You, you couldn't get a cheaper drink. Uh, and all I've got in terms of the the whiskey is, uh, is actually just a Dimple 12, just a cheap blend. Um, it's a go-to. I've pretty much always got some in uh, in the decanter. Uh, and it's just a good go-to when you need something inoffensive that isn't, it doesn't draw attention to itself. It just kind of does its thing and allows you to taste the cigar. It doesn't want you to taste it. It, it just accompanies whatever, you're, whatever you've got. So yeah. that's what I've got tonight. Now, boys, we haven't actually done a drink check. So this is a good opportunity. Tell us what, uh, what you boys have. Just a black tea, dude. Let me guess. Let me, no, no, hang on, hang on. I've been working. I have psychic powers. I, I need you should know this. I've been working on this. Uh, I'm I'm getting black tea. Mm. Yeah. There's a there's a there's a creaminess. Um, it's not from Nick Prodomo. It's from somewhere else. Um, it's a creaminess. Uh, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say you put cream in it. Yes. Yes. Right. And there is a sweetness. Um, and it's not my sweet innocence. It's it's different to that. It's um, I'm gonna say you've had black tea yeah. with milk, nah. and stevia. No milk. No milk. No cream. Sorry, with cream. Yeah. And stevia. Now that's gay. Ugh. Well, the, but but that's exactly why I assumed that's what you were having. Yeah. No. 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 You you are looking at the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Omar. Tell us what we already know. You're having the same drink as you always have. Nah, just a little bit of a cream and just a touch of honey in it. <laughs> because he's not man enough to drink his tea black. That's what it is. <laughs> like, are you worried that you'll turn blacker? 
Look, yes, I do, but <laughs> but um, when you smoke more than one or two or three cigars, that honey is just such a soothing effect. It's the key. See, I used to agree with you. That's why I used to drink port with my cigars, and then my balls dropped, yeah. and. I, could, I couldn't handle the sweetness. I needed like a man drink, which is why I drink whiskey neat. No ice, no water, no nothing. I just drink whiskey neat. Not bourbon. None of this sweet ass, like syrupy crap. Whiskey. Like a man. Um, so, so let me get this straight. Are you alleging that you used to have balls? I'm alleging that you grow a beard to compensate for the fact that you have to put milk I put cream and honey in your tea. I always had the beard. Compensating, that's all. Speaking of compensating, Damo, I couldn't help but notice, you know, you've really gone for the big cigars recently. Yeah, look, I, I just felt <laughs> as though uh, Omar could actually go with holding something of sub substantial girth in his hands. Yeah, in his little tiny girl hands. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's see if uh, let's see if our uh, our viewers are saying anything more intelligent than us right now. I mean, I'm sure they are. Uh, oh, thanks, Stu. That's very kind. Become the new Lord of the Rings. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, pretty boy Floyd, you're watching on YouTube. Can I suggest you send a uh, message to the Cigar Professor Facebook page? We do everything through Facebook. Sorry. Um, We've got stuff that's going to be really suitable. So, but I, of course, I can't talk about it here. Mm. So, sorry, it's just the rules are what they are. So, send us a message on Facebook. Um, yeah, there you go. So, your comment earlier, um, Damo, about how a really cold environment can make a cigar misbehave. Yeah. Uh, Stu is confirming he's in the freezing cold, and uh, he's the one who earlier told us he needed to use the perfect draw in his cigar. So, probably yeah. not a coincidence. Probably, yeah. probably the two are related. Look, my theory is that I can't prove it, but the um, cold air coming in causes the, the tars to drop out and, and sort of gum up in the leaves and, and cause those blockages. Yeah. Because, yeah. Because the only reason I say that too is the coldest nights over the years when you've been smoking in your garage with the door open have been the nights that you've actually had the tar actually coming out the back of the, the cigar and yeah. you've had to trim it off to get rid of it. So. And I'll, I'll add to that, actually, where it got really bad for, for a couple of weeks there, when, back when we were doing the show every week, I had about four or five, maybe six weeks in a row, and it was just a struggle. Uh, and that was actually when I kept the humidor in the garage. It was during winter, and so it stayed cold. But because it stayed steadily cold, it was on the south side of the house. The garage never got warm. The, the temperature was pretty steady. I kind of thought, well, what you need is a stable temperature, and a cooler temperature is going to slow down the rate at which the cigars age reduces your risk of any kind of mold or, or cigar beetle or any of this sort of stuff. So I thought it should be fine. It'll just sit there at sort of 14 to 16 degrees most of the time. And that's perfectly acceptable in terms of a two degree range up and down. But honestly, it was, it was during that period that I just had, I was having problems with every second or third cigar. It was, it was just ridiculous. Um, and, and then I kind of twigged and went, hang on, what's changed? What's changed is my humidor lives in the, in the garage now instead of inside the house. And when I got it back inside the house, put it back into the pantry, which again is a nice stable sort of a temperature. It doesn't change very much, but it was sitting around the 18 degrees mark instead of the, the 14, 15, 16 degrees mark. That couple of degrees made a world of difference and all those problems disappeared within a week or two. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, cigars don't like the cold. And I don't think it's a coincidence that, that you know, where they come yeah. from, it's a warmer climate. It's your Caribbean, your, your more equatorial sort of a climate. Um, and that's where they get smoked the most as well. And I, I think yes. they just, they like the warmer temperatures. Yeah. So, so Stuart, the, uh, the, the, the moral of this story is if you're in the cold area smoking a cigar, you need to get yourself a man cave with a nice fireplace and get it toasty and warm and sit inside next to a warm fire and smoke inside. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. 100%. Hundred percent. Now, and was Daniel, that a um, very unusual sideways ring that I saw just drop off the screen? Then, yeah, it just depends on what's happening with the with the airflow around the room. It just sort of pushes them around in different directions. 
Ah, oh, Daniel, Daniel, Daniel. He says, I can blow as many rings as he does with a whole cigar in just about five drawers, but okay. Um, <laughs> yes, Daniel, there's a reason why you're not invited. Um, you know, because I want to look like the, the Lord of the Rings, all right? So so you just back in your box. Sit well, in the actually, what we should do is we should set Daniel up against Aaron in a, uh, uh, yeah, well, a ring-blowing comp and see oh, which no, I would... of them rings. No, Ooh. sorry, sorry. Can we never, ever use the <laughs> phrase ring-blowing without starting with the word cigar? Cigar <laughs> ring blowing competition. Okay, can we? Just, it's, it's an important distinction, guys. It's. I mean, if you if you Google cigar ring blowing, and then Google ring blowing, you're going to get a very different set of results. I'm just yeah. saying. Okay, very different set of results. Um, uh, the Ave Maria one is called the Immaculata. Now, the whole Ave Maria range is pretty good. But for me, the Immaculata is their standout cigar. It's, yeah. That's the one that they've just got absolutely spot on. And I would rank among the best Connecticut's in the world. I just and the Immaculata is a, a, a lovely um, a blonde tan colour. And it has a second uh, silver band below the main um, colourful band that has Immaculata written on the silver band. That's the best way you can, you can pick it when you're looking. Yeah, Stephen's not wrong. Being cold also just spoils the experience. A campfire can make a difference, but nothing beats the warm of spring and summer, yeah. Sitting sitting outside at 10 o'clock at night in during summer, enjoying the last heat of the day, smoking a cigar, that's that's where it's at. That's where you want to be. Stu, move. Yeah. Move house. <laughs> Go and live somewhere else. Steve, I've tried pipe smoking. I've tried and given up. And then I go back to it and I try again and then I give up again. It's just, I just... I, just I'm in that same category. I'm in that same category. I've tried many times and they're finicky. The, you know, if yeah. you pack it too hard, they don't draw and burn well. If you pack it too loose, they burn too fast and hot. Um, it's definitely a technique that I am yet to master. Uh, and the thing that I really don't like about pipe smoking is the actual um, moisture accumulation in the pipe as you're smoking it, and then it, you, yeah. know, you accidentally end up sucking some of that up. What I have learned, though, and I was listening to, it might have even been Steve Sarker talking about this, or one of the um, cigar guys in America, when he does um, pipe smoking, he'll actually put um, the pipe tobacco in between two pieces of um, uh, paper toweling and microwave it for a 10 or 15 seconds just to drive off that little bit of moisture before he packs wow. it in to sort of cut back on the amount of moisture accumulation in the bowl, which I haven't tried yet, but that's something yeah. that next time I, I pull out a pipe and try it, I'm going to do that. Pipe smoking is shit and it's not worth a fucking time. <clears throat> How's that for a change? Get that Omar, the, the thing that frustrates me about you is how much you beat around the bush and don't tell us what you really think. Mm. <laughs> um, I just sometimes wish you'd just come out and say it, right? Just just yeah. come out and tell us what you think. I'm not that straightforward, dude. I'm trying. I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm not very intentful, man. I'm working now, on it. Now, Omar, Damo recently um, remembered that I exist and gave me some cigars to test and uh, to try to see whether we wanted to include them in future packs. Now, I know that's normally a role reserved for you and because – I was a Victorian. I, I wasn't fit for, for such duties. But obviously, now that I've moved into New South Wales, even if I'm right. just, uh, obviously, I qualify all of a sudden. So he actually sent me some. And he sent me some that actually have um, pipe tobacco rolled into them. So it's a, yep. it's a cigar. And the cigar itself hasn't been infused or anything like that. But it's got some pipe tobacco in it. And I have to say, I've actually I have a renewed appreciation for pipe tobacco, but in the context of a cigar. The actual, I think for me, it's not the flavor, it's the pipe smoking experience that's wrong. Mm. I'm, I'm assuming you've tried some of the same sticks. Yeah, and they were seriously amazing. I think, yeah. obviously, there's, it, it, it feels tight. It's, you know, it's a slightly different kind of cigar, but I yeah. really, really enjoyed it. I, I really enjoyed it. It was good. Yeah. And I like, I can't <laughs> smoke in, sorry, I cut you off. What was the, what was the end of that? I thought it will probably have problem with this burn, but it burned just throughout well. No, burned beautifully. Yeah. Yeah, burned beautifully. Yeah. So it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. 
to just say, yeah, it's, it's a funny one because I, I, I thought I didn't like the taste. There's five different ones I gave you. So yeah. they all, uh, this we had one, you and I had one together and that was that was great. glorious. Really the other enjoyed four, that. They're all, they, the labels all look the same, but if you read the very small micro print, they're, they're four different yeah. ones. Four yeah. different so I had the number one lens. and that gave me endless grief. That just yep. was nothing but trouble all the way through. Yep. Uh, and the other three are still waiting to get tried. Okay. So for our viewers who are not familiar with pipe tobacco, pipe tobacco is generally, not always, but generally a heavily infused tobacco. It's it's infused with um, fruits and spices, vanilla and and cardamom and 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 berry flavors and and notes of um, alcohols and liqueurs and things like that. And so, one of the things that pipe smokers will say is that the the Unburnt tobacco smells very fragrant and uh, very almost edible in its smell. Mm. But when you actually burn and smoke the pipe, it never seems to live up to that initial uh, fragrance that you get from it before you burn it. And the concept of that cigar with the pipe tobacco mixed in with it is to actually give you that experience of actually getting those beautiful flavor notes actually coming through in the smoke, not just having them in the tobacco before it's burnt. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So Stephen, those cigars that I've uh, uh, given Topher and I'm um, going to be doing some with Omar are the Stillwell stars. Uh, yeah. So the one that we actually uh, I've had it with Omar and I also had it with Topher was the Stillwell Star Christmas 2022. Yeah. And uh, it was the Navy that number one that uh, Topher said he had, that he had the, the trouble with. We've also got the other uh, couple of ones in the range, the English and... Um, now, to be clear... The other one called. Yeah, to be clear, the, the when the burn issues weren't happening, the flavour profile was lovely. But as any cigar smoker knows, once it's not burning properly, you're not getting the proper flavour profile anymore. The whole point is all of that tobacco has to be burning at the same rate to give you the flavour profile that the blender intended. If if the middle goes out, if, if one side goes out, if the, the, the edge, the wrapper starts to go out, any of these things happen, if it starts to tunnel, uh, your flavor just goes straight away. Often you you know you're having a burn issue often from the flavor change before you can actually see it, before it's actually visible to you. Once you once you're experienced, once you know what you're smoking. Um, so in those moments where it kind of corrected and it came good for 10 minutes or so, uh, the flavor was there. It was good. But I just had so many different issues over the length of that cigar, including a tunnel that ran through the middle of it, um, that I just couldn't enjoy it. I just couldn't. How's the cigar going, Turf? Look, this one's brilliant. Beautiful construction. I've had just zero issues with this cigar. I've dropped the ash once. It's getting close to be <clears throat> being ready to drop a second time. Um, beautiful flavor profile. It is building slowly. I will note, though, there's been an absence of flavor notes. There's been an absence of us going, oh, I just got this. Oh, I just got that. It's very consistent. It has been not much transition. Consistent, a bit same, same. Now, that's often the case with your milder cigars. You get your yes. surprises from your bolder cigars. They're the ones that are going to have a bit of stem or a bit of something that will just give you that flavor note for a moment. So it's not unexpected. No. But this really is a cigar that lends itself to what we're doing tonight, which is just having a good chat, really focusing less on the cigar. The cigar is, is, is an aside almost, oh, yeah. you know, to, to a good conversation. Um, having said that, beautiful. Beautiful. I'm, I'm finding that ginger spice has ramped up slightly in this final third. Look at that. Ring after ring after ring. Beautiful, thick, velvety ones as well. Good rings. Tofar is just uh, frozen, dude. Like, he's gone. He has. Fuck, you need to get a new computer or some shit. I don't know. I know. Whatever he wants to do. Oh, that was nice. Toy if you're back. I don't know what your problem is. Yeah, Mine was fine always, the whole way he through. hasn't got his fiber connection yet. That's the problem. Oh, that's right. That's right. Fucking excuse after excuse. I actually do. They finally hooked it up, but um, 
I'm on the phone at the moment, and, uh, and so that just goes through 5G. But um, we ordered fibre on the 12th of February this year. It was finally connected and actually working on, I think it was the 16th or the 20th or something of this month. It took more than six months to run a fibre optic cable one mile. And they connected it, physically they connected it over a month, they connected it about six weeks ago and the tech was standing there and he did his tests and he got all the right lights and it was all like, it was working. And he said to me, hey, you're all good. Um, you know, it's it's fine. You, you, you should get a text message in the next couple of days telling you that you're good to go. I got a text message about three days later telling me I'm good to go. I get in touch with my internet service provider and they're like, oh, sorry, we haven't had it updated in our back end. We can't, we can't connect you. I'm like, well, I've got, the, I've got the SMS. Like, surely they're not going to send out the SMS and not update, right? And um, so back and forth, back and forth for a couple of weeks asking for updates. And they're, you, know, you can't talk to NBN Co directly. You have to go through your ISP. So they're asking for updates from the NBN and then getting back to me with the information. It's just like, no, it's not working. It's not working. Finally, um, they get an update saying, oh, we've, we've connected all the hardware. And we're like, well, that happened like five weeks ago. And a tech comes to my house, and it's the same guy that connected me the first time, and he is in a bad mood. He was in such a bad mood. Not at me, but he was just, he was ropeable. And he says to me that they spent weeks working their way up one side of the street, putting injunctions at every house so that every house along the way could connect to that same fibre backbone that they were installing, right, to get to my house. And they did that up one side of the street. And some nuffy at NBN had gone and designed a second parallel line up the other side of the street and somehow NBN Co. had lost track of the fact that they were building a line up my side of the street. So they connected me to my side of the street and at the time it was all connected. And then when the other side of the street started, it all got disconnected and it didn't work. And then finally they finished the other side of the street and then they connected me. He was back to connect me to the other side of the street. <laughs> and then once that's done, he's being sent in to remove all of the hardware from his side of the street. Oh. Uh. And he's like, like he was angry. Like he's getting paid. He's getting paid to do it. It's not like he's getting ripped off as, at an individual level, but he's just angry. He's like, this is perfectly good infrastructure that we've just replicated for no reason. And crews, teams of people have spent weeks digging pits and putting injunctions and ripping up you know, footpaths and all sorts of stuff uh. to do this. And it's just a complete waste of taxpayers' money. And so meant that I had to wait an extra five or six weeks after I should have to actually <coughs> connect to the NBN. Ridiculous. What happens if someone on your side of the street now wants to connect, though? Hmm. They got no, no they only need to run up one street. side of the street and they can connect both. That's right. not the issue. But they didn't need to run up both sides of the street. That's the issue. Right. They just needed one fiber line running up one side of the street and everyone would have been happy. But somehow they lost track. of The, the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing and they went and built both. I still stand by my statement that if you want to bugger something up and blow it out of budget and never be able to deliver on its completion of the project, just give it to the government to do. Oh, for sure. Guaranteed. For sure. You're preaching to convert it here. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to up you one on that, Daniel. The uh, celery note that Topher was picking up earlier in the piece, that freshness, for me at the moment, I'm almost getting it like a bit of fresh fennel. Hasn't quite strengthened to, to that for me yet. I'm, I'm into, I'm not quite at the final third, but I'm getting close. Oh, goodness, you're, you've raced ahead, Damo. Yeah, I'm same as Topher. I'm yeah. having to puff a little bit more to try and get the flavours through my sinuses. Ah, yes. Yes, of course. You able to retro hat at the moment? Not really. I can, mm -hmm. but it doesn't do much. <laughs> I don't normally do it anyway because I don't really know how. <laughs> I feel type of pain. The whole NBN Co. is a giant waste of cigar duty. Wow. <laughs> Way to make it feel personal. <laughs> Spending my cigar duty on that. So, boys. So, speaking of uh, this NBN thing, 
Um, my friend, I've got a bunch of people that aren't my friend, but they're friends because her wives are friends with my wife, right? So I don't fucking like them. I don't like them. Don't want to spend time with them. Hopefully, don't, none of them are listening. But... This is going to be a great story. You just know. <laughs> you just know this is going to be a great story. Um, just figured out that one of them smokes cigars. So I was like, oh, you saw me smoking cigars. What do you do smoking cigars? It's like, oh, yeah, that's what I do in my spare time. And oh, we kind of become closer and we start talking. And we now we smoke cigar every now and then. We go to a cigar. So it's so shisha bar. So don't have a cigar. So just going from that story that you were saying about the NBN. So he's quite an accomplished engineer. And he's going to AGSM, which is the most pioneer place to do MBA in Australia. You know, whatever. So I said, talking to myself, so, so what exactly do you do? I'm not going to tell you what he works for. So <clears throat> he works on projects that starts from, you know, 200 million, goes up to a billion dollars and so on and so forth, the government projects. <clears throat> his job, are you ready for this? His job, when they do tendering, they know they're going to do the best tender, they're going to win the contract. Good. His job, his, that dude in question's job, is to then find ways to extract hundreds of millions on top of whatever, whatever. And he was so excited. He goes, this is me. He goes, when shit goes wrong, I justified that money. And that's why they pay me. <laughs> and he was saying the process and how he does. I was like, oh, my God. He goes, they start with that. That's why I'm in, mm -hmm. on the books. <clears throat> Well, this is this is an open secret. Even the politicians and the bureaucrats that approve these contracts, they already know this. Yes, and it's 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 in both of their interests. Think about the politician that's making the announcement. Oh, we've we've commissioned this project for this amount of money. He wants the amount of money to seem like less, right? So yeah. he has a vested interest in picking a tender that has a lower price. The problem is, the 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 problem is. That the, the the lower price, like when you when you when the pressure on the tender is to get the lowest possible price, they start to underquote or they start to to, to strip yes. away things that are kind of needed because they know as the company that's doing the tender, they've got to come in with a really good price. So it's now accepted and it's normal. And I know this because I know people that would do that work in road construction, big road construction projects, are uh, involved yes. in the tenders and involved in the engineering. Yes. Uh, so what they do is they put in a tender that has a really good price on on the front. And heaps of clauses and contingencies built into it. This is the price, unless this happens, in which case they will add that. And unless that happens, and it's just accepted and known that in those contingencies is a whole bunch of basically business as usual. Everyone yeah. knows that those contingency clauses are going to be activated and that money is going to be spent. But it's yeah. in the best interest of the politician to have that cheap price up front. Yes. Uh, and they just know it's it's that price is a lie. And you know what's the most interesting part he said to me, and that's verified by another person who, whose job is to look at numbers and statistics, numbers, statistics. I mean, as in money statistics. Sure. Not just any statistics, right? He said, that's, that's what he does. And they both said one thing to me. They said, do you know any project that hits, by the way, it's all cigar conversations. They only have sure. cigars. A project that hits a B next to it. He goes, there is no software no assessment ever in the world that can verify anything. When you start hitting Bs, there is absolutely zero, zero idea that anyone has when you start hitting the Bs. Oh, I was like, you fuckers, you motherfuckers. Well, what does it mean when they start hitting the hundreds of billions? Yes. The, uh, down in Victoria, we've got this this suburban rail loop that's going, and they're quoting, I think, 100 or 120 billion off the top of my head. I can't remember yeah. what the number is. It's like at that point, like that project yeah. is so big, a 10% yes. overrun, a 10% budget, which we know they never they never come in at only a 10% budget overrun. Yeah. They come in at a 50% or 100% budget overrun. But just a 10% budget overrun is $10 billion. It's it's <laughs> absurd. To be, to be building a, a project at that scale in a single hit, quoted as a single project, is just madness. Tov, only if you knew the way they fuck up the weather data. 
what had happened in past. Oh, yeah. oh my God. This is just crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. And we have only ourselves to blame for how ridiculous it is. Yep. It's just infuriating. Well, in your own words, we get the government we deserve. Sadly, yes. Sadly, yes. There's a bunch of viewers that have faithfully stuck around putting up with the smoking cigars, waiting for the uh, the, the political conversation to finally start. Well, here you are. The political conversation has <laughs> <Yeah>. started. <laughs> So it takes that much of a cigar to get into decent conversation. See, this is this yeah. is this is why I think we should mandate cigar smoking in Parliament. Yes, yes. And 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 and, and parliamentary uh, debate and question time can't start till at least forty-five minutes into the cigar. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh my god, man, I'd love to see some of them on a nicotine hit. They'd be turning green. They'd have to bring in buckets, not as spittoons, but as puke buckets next to all the MP seats. <laughs> No, I love this stuff. So so Fred Bloggs is trying back, and he's a regular troll of mine. Uh, Topher, you're a gopher-headed boar, and yet here you are an hour and 26 minutes and 30 seconds into this video, yes. and you're still hanging around like a bad smell commenting. So welcome, Fred. Stick around. It's like, it just, it amuses me so much. These people put effort into trying to troll and making zero difference as, as a result. And I just, I sit there, I think two things. Number one, if you actually put that effort into doing something constructive, you might actually do something good with your life. So, you know, number one, misallocation of resources here, guys. So like, do something yeah. useful with your life. Number two, they often like to, and in this case, he, he didn't. Well, I mean, he kind of did. You know, you're a gopher-headed idiot, whatever. He's trying to demean me and the contribution that I have, right? And you go, well, hang on. If you're demeaning me and saying that my contribution is meaningless, then how meaningless is the contribution of someone who's spending time trying to reduce my contribution? Right? He's trying to detract from what I'm doing, but he's doing it by saying I'm doing nothing. So he's trying to detract, detract from nothing. Like he's literally putting himself in a position where he is meaningless. And, and by his own words, what he's yeah. doing with his life and with his time is literally meaningless. And I just like I read these things and I'm like, dude, you just insulted yourself, but you're too dumb to see it. Go and do something useful with your life. The only thing I would say about, about this is that I think there's still hope. If you get him onto cigars, he may. You know, he may, he may. You're not wrong. Like you never know. You're not wrong. Yeah. You just never know. You can knock some uh, quarter of Look, I, 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 ha I have seen cigars convert Democrats to Republicans in America. So there's hope yet. There you go. Well, mind you, I don't think the Republicans are much to write home about in America either. So. Yeah, that's right. And, this is true. and I've seen the other way around, too. There you yeah, go. The gas convert Republicans into Democrats. Yes. All, all I want seen, all I want to see happen is cigars convert um, pig-headed idiots into people that can have a conversation. That's right. Right. Which, right? which is if, very If possible. that can happen, then the world becomes a better place. Which way they go politically, blah, 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 whatever, don't mind. Just if it can convert someone from an idiot into someone that can have a conversation with someone they disagree yes. with and actually have a real conversation, yeah. then it's a win. That's a win. That's a hundred percent win because because of the, the fact of the matter is I think twins can have very different opinions. That's absolutely okay. Sure. But to be able yeah. to discuss that and why you have that is is the key. Yeah. Yeah, I want to be a total anarchist in the political spectrum. I just want to get rid of the parties altogether. Just have everybody yeah. as an independent representing their constituents and uh, let them uh, vote according to what their constituents want and their own uh, personal conscience. Well, my son's name is Winston, and we didn't actually name him after Winston Churchill, but uh, I was... It was a coincidence that I was very happy, and my wife was also very happy to have him associated with. Yeah, that'd be an interesting reform. We've lost the art of debate in cigars. Confused. I agree, Daniel. I agree. Well, Winston Churchill certainly knew how to debate, and he smoked cigars, so case closed. I, I reckon another thing they need to bring in Parliament. When they got question time and a yes/no question is asked, 
the only acceptable answer is a yes no answer. No, disagree. You disagree on yes, that? Yes, no answers can be framed as a trap. Yes, right. I agree. The, the obvious example is have the you stopped no. beating your wife yet? Okay, yes. Okay, that's the obvious example. No, I, I completely disagree with you on that one. Yeah. yeah some, some questions, their notion has to be has to be corrected or tested or, or you know, uh, questioned itself. Um, They're based on a premise that is wrong. That's right. That's right. But <laughs> I've seen in the U.S. Senate uh, or congressional hearing where it's like, why do you have women's toilets? Why? Because they are women and they are fundamentally women. That's what you fucking call them. And, and apparently they need toilets. That's right. Um, you know, so things like that, that, you know, I, I know where demo is coming from, but I think you, you can do blanketly. You can't do that blanketly. Well, the thing I get sick of is when somebody asks a simple question like, yes. was the minister aware that such and such was happening under your watch? And they go on about, mm. we've done this and we've done that and we're promising this and we're promising that. And then they sit down and then the same question gets asked again. Was the minister mm -hmm. aware that this was go this level of corruption yeah. was taking place under your watch while you were the yeah. minister in charge? Oh, yes, we've promised this and we've we've fulfilled this election promise and that, and then they sit down again. And the question never gets answered. Yeah, never. Well, I love, I, I love the one where they get asked the question the second, the third, or fourth time. And they're like, I've already answered that question. You're like, No, you haven't. You've already avoided that question two or three times. Still yeah. haven't answered it. Look, I'm, I'm of the view that sunlight is the best disinfectant. I think a lot of these other sort of rules and restrictions that get proposed are largely being proposed because they're trying to solve the problem of politicians being dishonest and so forth. But that problem exists because not enough people are paying attention. And so yeah. fundamentally, if more people actually tuned in to watch Question Time, if more people showed up to the local council to watch, you know, local council yeah. meetings and, and so forth, if more eyeballs were tuned in, the politicians would automatically have to begin. It would take a little bit of time, but as they became aware of more and more people paying attention and keeping track and, and, and holding them accountable, if not in person, at least in, in the public square of public opinion, holding them accountable for their behaviour, they would have to start improving their behaviour. The problem is they get away with it. The media is not holding them accountable, and so there's no penalty for it. What we could do is when the politician gets asked a question, they could sit on, you know, that game at the, at the, um, the you know, they used to have at school fates and amusements where the guy sits on the seat above the water and you've got to throw the ball at the, at the, yeah. the target to drop in the water. They yeah. could give balls to everyone in the, in the uh, public seating section and the guy's sitting on there and like, if they don't like the answer, they can all just start pegging balls to see if they <laughs> drop him in the water. I think you'd probably have too many people showing up to Parliament at that point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that'd be a good thing though, wouldn't it? <laughs> It'd be hilarious. <laughs> We'd all start watching the ABC. <laughs> well, question time anyway. Mm. Definitely getting a bit more of a, a a spice bite on the cigar as I'm getting towards the finish. Well, I'm I'm now into that area where I think you must have been as you started to get that fennel note because that started to creep in for me. That little bit of a little bit of a it's not a licorice, it's a fennel. A little bit of a, you know, it's vegetative and it's got that twist on the tongue. Uh, definitely a bit of a bit of a fennel note there. The crispness of that celery, the, the the really light, bright celery that I had early on is definitely darkened. Yep. Um, there is still a sweetness there, but it's not, the sweetness is not in the fennel flavour. It's separate to that. It's a, there's almost a molasses that runs kind of separate to the to the fennel in this. So the sweetness is still there but it's definitely darkened a lot. And that toasty flavor has turned into a, like a, 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 a burnt molasses kind of a, a, yeah. a flavor. I was going to say burnt caramel. Yeah. In, in, in that vein. Steve. Yeah. Look, I can see, I can see why I became your friend. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, there's there's no other reason why I would have, but but this that's that was enough to blind me to all of the other obvious flaws. I knew what I was doing. <laughs> Is that how you got married as well? <laughs> 
no comment. <laughs> Couple of good comments there uh, that I must just sort of scrolled through. Uh, which council is that that's banned you from actually attending their meetings? I'd be curious to know because I'm not sure that they have the authority in reality to do that. Now, of course, they can do whatever they want, and the council workers and, and security, etc., will do whatever they're told. It'd be a court case; you'd have to sue them to get access to the council meetings if they want to ban you. But I'm fairly sure that they don't have the power to stop the public from attending their their meetings. Um, so Karen, I'd, I'd be curious to know if you could let us know what um, what council are you in? <clears throat> Is now smoking better, good to hear. Uh, Stephen, no, I don't think voting should be compulsory, but, but I think voluntary voting should be accompanied with a number of other reforms. It shouldn't be a reform that's made on its own. Yeah, um, but there's, as a, there's a number of reforms that we need to make. Yeah. Uh, one of them is voluntary um, voting, but another one is also voluntary um, preferential at the moment yeah. essentially preferential voting is mandatory so yeah. the voting is mandatory and you have to vote preferentially yeah. uh, and i think both each of those components should be should be voluntary voluntary uh, and there's a few other reforms that need to happen at the same time if you if you make one or two reforms on their own even though those reforms individually may be good if they're going into a system that is broken in other ways it can make things worse uh, so, for example, people in Victoria are saying we want to get rid of group voting tickets. That's where the, the party decides where your preferential vote flows. That's all well and good, but getting rid of preferential, um, getting rid of group voting tickets in the Victorian system would very much serve the entrenched parties. Uh, if it was in the New South Wales system, that would actually be, a, you know, in, in, in more of the New South Wales way of voting for the upper house across the entire state. That would, that would be a much more democratic reform, but getting rid of group voting tickets without reforming how the upper house is elected would actually be a backward step for a number of technical reasons that are beyond the scope of this show. So I agree, but these reforms need to be looked at uh, and almost sort of combined so that we make a number of the right reforms at the same time, uh, because individually they might be good, but actually going into a broken system, some of those reforms could lead to some really bad outcomes. Uh, Mackay, that's interesting. Mackay, Since why we're uh, in an environment that's talking about constitutional change, one of the constitutional changes I'd like to see, I think, is at Switzerland, where the people can actually um, basically force the government to run a, a referendum on something and actually um, put forward a bill and actually, you know, put it, get it through if the government well, doesn't want it, but enough people vote for it. In Switzerland, and I stand to be corrected on this, but if my memory serves me correctly, in Switzerland, basically every law is a referendum. Right. So they go to the polls on a regular basis and every proposed law is actually on the poll and they can say yes to this one, no to that one, no to that one, yes to that one, etc. Yeah. Um, and so essentially every single law is brought in by referendum. And I believe that's also done on a canton by canton basis. There isn't so much a federal system in, in Switzerland. And again, this is... Um, Forgive me if I'm if I'm not correct on this, but this is my my recollection of how it is. Um, it's a very clumsy system, according to some. They say, "Oh, it's very hard to reform things," but I look at that as a as a feature, not a bug. Uh, if it's very well, hard to ram new laws through, and very hard to change things. Like one of the one of the biggest problems that, that I face with my business in the uh, fireworks and explosives, and uh, also cigars, and then my wife in her business in importing uh, uh, food products is that there is a constant change in regulation. And yeah. even though the government knows that we exist and to the best of our ability as small mum and dad businesses trying to keep on top of this change, something that was okay last month, we then go to, we run out of stock, we've got a job, we put an order and we get something and all of a sudden the government kiboshes us on the job. Oh no, you can't do that anymore. The law's changed. Well, nobody told us, oh, well, you should have, kept up to date with the laws yeah. and Ignorance when you go no digging excuse. through the laws yourself it takes yeah. you the best part of three or four hours of digging through bureaucratic nightmare the website hasn't been updated the links are broken and you've got to go through all this convoluted process to find it oh now you need to have this permit and yeah. i kid you not there was a circumstance where we actually went through and got the permit and the next month the law reverted back and we didn't need the permit anymore when we finally got approval to bring the product back in again and we spent days and hundreds of dollars getting the damn permit that we didn't end up yeah. needing after all. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. We have hear a you. system where the people restrict the ability for the law to change so frequently, businesses are able to just get on and do their job, create uh, jobs. I think what's really valuable... 
sorry about that. I think what's really valuable about the Swiss system is you have a genuine opportunity as an ordinary citizen to know about the laws that are being passed mm. because they were on a piece of paper that you could show up to and vote for and it's well publicized and it's just a part of their sort of civic culture that they show up and they read these things and they decide which ones they like and which ones they don't. The laws also need to be written in plain English or not plain English, sorry, but in, in, in ordinary man's language. Because yes. if they're written co in a convoluted way that people don't understand, people default to a no, right? It's the same with, with referendums in Australia. If people don't understand it, you know, <clears throat> if, if you don't know, vote no. That's the, <clears throat> that's the classic thing with referendums in Australia. That's why most referendums fail is actually because people just have uncertainty about it. Um, and, and it's the same with this sort of a system in, in Switzerland where people's default position is to vote no unless they actively like that law. And therefore, the law needs to be written in a way where the ordinary person who hasn't been a part of the campaign, wasn't even necessarily aware of it when they showed up to the voting booth, can sit down, read that thing and go, actually, yes, I do want that to be on the books as a law. Uh, yeah. And so the laws have to be written in a way that people can understand them as well. Otherwise, they just don't get in. Yeah. And look, I go back to the first time I voted was the referendum for the Republic. Oh, yeah. And when I got in there and looked at what was presented, it was really just a yes, no. Do you want to do yeah. this? Yes or no? It's like, yeah. well, maybe I do, but spell it out for me. What is it going to look yeah. like? How's it going to work? There was no information there. Yeah. It's, I'm not about to sign a blank check to people I wouldn't trust with my kids yeah. to make up a whole set of laws that are going to dictate the rest of my life. Yeah. Like if you want 100%. me to give you my support, I want to know every minute detail of how it's going to work and how it's going to affect me and what's it going to mean for my life down the track, not yeah. just sign a blank check. Yeah. Now, Shell's making a really great point here. Uh, I actually disagree with you, Shell, but let's, let me just work through this step by step. There was a referendum about creating a third tier of government being the local councils, and we did say no. That should have been the end of the story. That should have been a case of, okay, the people have said no, therefore we won't do it. In our system... The state governments do have the power to delegate. Or he must be lying. Local councils exist under a, a delegation of authority from state governments. And uh, technically, that is lawful. So to say that they're unlawful is not actually correct. To say that they're unconstitutional is not technically correct. Uh, morally, I think that's correct. I don't think they should exist. I don't think the constitution... I, I think the constitution should have provisions where if the people reject something uh, at a referendum, that it shouldn't be allowed to be legislated. Uh, but unfortunately, that is the case where it can legally be legislated. So if you go to a, a court and you say the local council is unlawful and unconstitutional, you're going to lose that case because they do have laws in place that delegate state authorities down to the local councils. And there is nothing in the constitution that says they can't legislate something that was rejected in a referendum. Here's so an, here's I think an at a moral level, point, though. constitutionally, do the state governments have the power to create another tier of government or are the local councils technically just uh, regional offices of the state government? They're essentially regional offices. They're, they're, they are bureaucracies where we have a say in who gets to sit on the board of that bureaucracy. That's essentially, right. that's essentially what it is, right? Um, they've delegated power to the councils in the same way as they delegate power to all the alphabet agencies that we have. They do have the authority to do that at a legal level. So, so realistically, they shouldn't really be referring to themselves as a local council. They should be referring to themselves as the local office of state government. Possibly. Uh, Shell, you're going to have to remind me which section 109 is. Uh, I have read the Constitution in full. I read the full annotated Constitution, but it was a very, very long time ago. Yeah, the local government acts exactly. That's that's how they did it, and it's what they're going to do with the voice as well. So the voice is going to fail at a referendum if it gets to a referendum. I've been predicting all the way through that they'll actually pull the pin before the referendum. I stand by that prediction. I may be wrong, but I, at the moment, I stand by that prediction. They're not going to let it get to a referendum because it's just going to be too toxic for them if they lose. Um, so they'll pull the referendum and then they'll ram it through in the form of legislation. It's immoral. It shouldn't be done uh, at, a, at an in principle and a moral level. I agree, it shouldn't happen. But technically, at a legal level, they can do it. Uh, and if you challenge it in court on the basis of it being unconstitutional, 
uh, you're going to lose that court case, unfortunately. And people have tried, and 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 you you lose that court case. Had an interesting conversation the other week with a constitutional lawyer, and um, it was interesting. I was speaking to a constitutional lawyer, and I was more familiar with the constitution than he was. And he he was just we were just talking about the upcoming ref, possible referendum on the voice, and he said, "Well, what's your biggest objection?" I said, "Well, look." The, the Constitution spells out who can stand to be elected as a politician the, and basically the consequences if they are, do the wrong thing and how they can be removed and if th there's the check and balances of the Governor-General, if you know all, all things go wrong, the Governor-General can step in and dissolve it. I said, none of that has been presented in The Voice. And he goes... Does it say, you know, that? And I said, yeah, because that was what Rod Cullison and uh, someone else was kicked out of uh, politics because, you know, supposedly had a uh, insolvency or, or some other thing mm. brought against them. It's, uh, eventually they cleared their name and couldn't get their seat back. But he actually went back and he goes, oh, I never noticed that in the Constitution before. And I was thinking, yeah. crikey, constitutional lawyer didn't even know that in the Constitution. Yeah. How much less do people in our general society and particularly kids going through school who are you know getting prepped to vote know even less about our constitution i think that should yeah. be a, a mandated document that we learn in school high school so shell my, my question for you would be which commonwealth law is it that um that prohibits the delegation of state power into our local council um you know so to the degree of the of the inconsistency uh, the, 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 the Commonwealth law uh, is valid and the state law is invalid to the degree of the in inconsistency. So the state law remains as far as it is not inconsistent. What is it about Commonwealth law that in your understanding applies uh, and, and would prohibit a state from delegating power to a, to a council? That then becomes the question. I know of an example that violates uh, Section 109 of the Constitution. Firearms sure. Act. You're, you're not allowed. Sure. You're, basically, you've got no right of appeal um, if you're uh, found guilty of a certain firearms offence. Like under other offences, you can appeal and appeal and appeal. And the ultimate right of appeal under the Constitution is right up to the Privy Council. Right. Um, but under New South Wales state legislation, uh, your right of appeal basically is gone under the Firearms Act. They're actually in the Firearms Act that basically says. You know, basically, you, you don't get that right to appeal. Um, which, which is interesting because the, the, the Firearms Act, so you're talking about the National Firearms Agreement or you're talking about a state act? Because the Firearms Agreement that's a, that's is a, a different... state act. Uh, because basically, yeah, yeah. the agreement was that all states would harmonise their, their laws, uh, but e the laws in, in every state are individual yeah. laws. So, so, so. To my, yeah, that, that would be an interesting one to challenge in court. You'd need a lot of money to do it and, uh, and a lot of time and, and a lot of support. Um, that would be an interesting one to challenge because there are limits around what a, a law can do in terms of abrogating your rights and especially your rights to due process. Um, that, would, that would require an enormous amount of money. Um, yeah. yeah, one of the things that really concerns me uh, at a sort of a lower level, we're talking at a very high level constitutional level there, one of the things that really concerns me is the number of people that have shared with me privately that they were unwilling to join the anti-lockdown protests in Victoria because they were licensed firearms owners. And what we knew and what we saw, it's documented, there's a video of this happening, where firearms owners were being visited by the police and having their firearms confiscated and their licenses suspended and so forth, being deemed to not be a fit and proper person anymore to hold a, yep. a firearms license because they had participated in and been identified on police uh, video as someone who had showed up to an anti-lockdown protest. And so this use, this abuse of the licensing process to then manipulate people and to, to ensure their compliance in completely unrelated areas, uh, I, I think is, is entirely inappropriate. That's something that, that I, I would imagine could be challenged in court and, and, um, and you'd probably be able to win on, on that one because it's just such an unrelated issue to the, to, you know, is that you don't have a criminal record, you haven't met any of the thresholds that would actually legally be grounds to deny you a firearms license, uh, but they use that as, as leverage anyway. Yeah. Uh, Karen's responded here, our council is a dictatorship. We've been informed that if we want to question anything, it has to be in writing. 
And if they don't feel the need to respond, they won't. So, Karen, I don't know what the um, Mackay, Queensland, I don't know what the Queensland um, Local Council Act is like, but local councils often have their hands very much tied because the act uh, under which they're created gives them certain responsibilities, gives them certain powers, um, and if they're acting outside of that, then then uh, they can get into a lot of trouble for that. Now, that doesn't stop them from acting outside of that. It just means that someone has to have the money and the time to then sue them uh, and to challenge their authority to do that. So they can do it, but then someone has to challenge it. Um, denying you access to their council meetings, I would be surprised, and I, I don't know. I've never read the Queensland Local, Local Government Act. I don't even know what its name is. Um, but I would be surprised if they had the power to deny public access to their meetings that uh, if they had that authority that would surprise it's not impossible but that would surprise me um so it might be worth actually getting a hold of the 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 queensland local government act whatever it's called whatever act it was whatever legislative instrument created councils in the first place in queensland and having a bit of a look at a bit of a look at that and, and understanding what what powers were they given uh and what responsibilities do they have uh, for transparency and responsiveness. I mean, yeah, your, your, your federal politicians, again, I don't know this for a fact, but my understanding is, uh, and actually, David Leinholm, you're, you're watching at the moment. Could you please, could you please chime in on this? Because you, you would know. It's my understanding that um, politicians are required to actually respond to constituents. Uh, and, and often they, they do that in the form of an autoresponder that says, hey, we've received your correspondence. And they kind of tick that box and go, yes, we've now, we've responded to that email. But my understanding is that there is a requirement that there has to be a response from uh, from federal politicians at the very least. I'd be I'd be amazed if local councils could bar their own constituents from their meetings. You know, one of the things that I love, well, I don't love, this is, this is my sarcasm. I've had issues with statutory authorities in the past. That was a gorgeous ring. Um, my aim is on point tonight. Oh, Absolutely. You, you, you make a complaint to the minister over a governmental bureaucracy, mm -hmm. something you don't agree with, and rather than them dealing with the issue, all they do is they forward your complaint onto the very same people that you're complaining about and get them to respond to you. Yeah. And nothing ever gets resolved. Nothing ever gets done. Yeah. Like, you've, you've dealt with a bureaucracy and said, you know, you're, you're fighting. It's like a, hitting your head against a brick wall. The legislation says this, I should be allowed to do this or I'm applying for this or I need this letter of exemption or I'm applying, you know, I've got a right to appeal for this and they just ignore you or, or, or fob you off. You go to the minister and all the minister says, yes, I forward your inquiry onto the, the relevant thing and then you get a letter back from the same person you've been arguing with in the department saying, oh, your letter and the, the case is still the same. We're, we're not going to do anything about it. So... So most politicians, and there are some exceptions, but most politicians are not interested in getting involved in any of the real argy-bargy. Um, they're interested in uh, maybe a little bit of grandstanding. They're interested in getting re-elected. Um, they're, they're interested in, in sort of the public relations side of it, but they're not actually interested in getting into the real nitty-gritty and getting into any kind of a real bun fight. They're especially wary of getting into a fight with the public service. Here's the thing with the public service. They continue when the government changes. Yes. Right. With only a, usually only a handful of exceptions of sort of the government appointed heads of departments. Everyone else keeps their jobs. Everyone else continues. And so you get a politician that comes in, a newly elected politician who's all gung ho and wants to make a change and all the rest of it. And they then turn around to their various government departments that they want to hold accountable. Okay, there's no obligation on politicians to respond. Interesting. Okay, I will I will go back and do some research because there is something, and it may be at a Victorian state level, it may not be federal, um, there is something that requires a response from some some level of politics. It's just this, it's from literally 10 years ago or more. There's something there. I'll try and dig it up and find out what it is. Uh, and maybe next month, when we come back on The Cigar Professor, <laughs> we might talk about it again. I'll try and get to the bottom of why it is that I thought different or where it is that it is different, whatever that may be. Um, but, 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 yeah, they don't want to start a fight with bureaucrats because the bureaucrats, by the time they're getting up in the senior ranks of the bureaucracy that they're in, they've usually been bureaucrats for a decade or more, you know, probably 20 years, maybe 30 years. And there's a certain level of patience that comes with that. 
where they sit there and go, oh, we've got a new minister for X, Y, Z, and they, they're all gung-ho and they want to change this and they want to do that and they want to blah, blah, blah. You know what? If we just slow play everything and just make it really, really slow for them to get the information they want or to get the responses or to get whatever it is, then we know that in three years there's another election. Or if they're a minister, there could be a cabinet reshuffle in only a year and a half, two years for political reasons. If we can just slow play this person and drag our feet, then we can outlast them. And so the bureaucracy has become very, very adept at surviving the few good politicians that do want to reform it. Um, and it's it's at the point, in my opinion, for whatever that's worth, that we, we need a, a Thatcher-esque figure, uh, a, a, for, to use an Australian example, a, a Jeff Kennett type figure, who's willing to come in with a battle axe and just go slash, 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 and, and not engage in the conversation, not give them that opportunity to drag the feet. Oh, yes, we're working on that, Mr. Prime Minister. We're working on that, Premier. Uh, you know, we'll come back to you shortly and just playing that waiting, delaying game. Someone that just comes in and goes, no, nope, we're shutting entire departments down and there's no conversation to be had. That's, we're really at the point where, where unless that happens um, or until that happens, we're really captured by the bureaucracies. Should the public perhaps have more of a say on the hiring and firing of bureaucracies, a bit like in America where they elect their sheriffs and they elect their judges. Maybe in, a, in Australia we could, uh, you know, bureaucracies that are just being convoluted and, and really working against the better in, um, interest of society. Society can basically just go, you know what, you guys are really not doing what society wants. We're going to get rid of you and get a new team of people in there that are actually going to do a proper job and, and work with us and, and, and bring about the reformation that society wants. So the direct election of, of some public officials or, or of more, sorry, public officials than what we have in Australia, I think would be a good thing. But even in America, we're not talking about the direct election of the heads of bureaucracies. They're not directly electing no. the, head of the FBI or the CIA or the IRS or any of these things. They're directly electing their local sheriffs, their local representatives. Now, also understand the American system is the inverse of the Australian system in the sense that the Australian system says the federal takes primacy over all the other layers of government. The minute the federal yeah. government writes a law that covers the field, no one else's opinion matters, no one else's laws matter. The federal, and we saw this with Section 109 that was brought up a second ago. The federal government trumps everybody else. The system is a bit different in the US. There are specific powers delegated to um, the, the federal government in the US. The rest are reserved to the states. Now, that there's been massive scope creep on that. There's been massive um, exceeding of federal government powers, in my opinion. Um, however, the principle remains that the power is meant to be reserved down to those lower levels of government. And so electing your local sheriff is a much more significant thing in the US system than electing your local chief of police would be in Australia. Yeah. Right? It's, it's the, the, the local chief of police in Australia doesn't have a lot of power. They don't get to make their own decisions, really. They just have to do what they're, do what they're told, uh, as we saw quite famously in, in Australia. I'm about to go out. Give me a sec. Yeah, I'm done. Yeah, I'm done too. Really? Well, I've talked too much, so I'm going to let that sit for a minute. We might wind up the show. Look, it's been we, – we got a solid hour and 45 out of that cigar. It took us a little while to light up, but we got a solid hour and 45. Hour, hour another... 50 hour for me. Yeah, I've, I've got another. I've got another ten minutes once I relight that, which I'll do uh, after we finish the show. Look, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you to everyone that stayed with us all the way through uh, to the end. We've we've got uh, got a good number of people still watching. Obviously, distributed across all the different platforms. We're going out, I think, to eight different pages at the moment. Um, so, <laughs> so everyone's a bit sort of fragmented in terms of where they're viewing and what comments they're seeing. Uh, but I can see the, the the cumulative number here, and and I'm very grateful for all the different comments. Um, just having a look at one or two of their last sort of comments here. Uh, thanks, Stephen. You've been very active and really appreciate it. Great stick. It's, it is a great stick. It really is. Um, and, um, yeah, there you go. Confirmation. I worked uh, for a fed, federal agency, and that is exactly what they do. Yeah, they slow play. They absolutely slow play just to, to outweight the politicians and, and get what they want in the end anyway. Anyway, politics aside, great cigar. I'm so glad. That, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Damo. I believe that's our first Churchill on the Scar Professor. Uh, last week was uh, last month was the Churchill as well, the command show that you guys did that I wasn't on. Oh, well, fine. Contradict me. 
<laughs> um, that was our second church. But any, at any rate, I'm correct in saying we weren't able to do Churchill's when we were doing a cigar every week because the budget correct. just didn't allow. We were trying to keep That's the budget correct. under control. You're smoking a cigar a week. We just couldn't do it. Now that we've gone to the monthly format, obviously the, the price of each pack is a lot lower than what it used to be. Uh, so yep. it's more accessible to people. We're only smoking three cigars. But at the same time, uh, we're now able to get some of these really, really beautiful and big uh, cigars in. So Damo, well, I'm gonna once again. I'm going to out of the bag for one of the future packs, whether it's the next mm. pack or the one after. I haven't yet decided. Right. But I did manage to secure. Remember we did the Pledge prequel, Cigar of the Year? Uh, yes. And that was a fantastic cigar. And we've also done on two occasions now the uh, Podomo Firecracker, which I cornered yep. almost the world supply of those limited edition cigars. And I've still got quite an inventory of those in my own private stash. So yep. what I was actually thinking, because it's such a small stick in uh, – well, actually – what they've released this year was they did the pledge prequel as a firecracker Vitola as a limited release. And I've managed to secure for us a couple of boxes. So I'm actually thinking because it's a small stick and, you know, trying to keep the budget up on, on, you know, with, you know, with the budget that we've got to play with. Sure. I'm actually thinking on one of the episodes, we might do the Podomo firecracker and the pledge firecracker in one episode back to back. It'll be a two cigar show. Well, I mean, you say it's a small stick. It's not that small of a stick. It's a medium-sized stick. It's a three, three and a half or three and five-eighths or something like that. Yeah. I, but, like, I mean, that, that's uh, still, listen, two of them is still shorter than a Churchill. Any time that you're offering to raid your private collection <laughs> and bring some of these sticks that you've had ageing for years out and offer them to the rest of us plebs to smoke, um, I'm on board. I'm a big yes. Oh, yes. That sounds so, fantastic. That's so, well, one, one, and, and one Omar's one sitting there going, well, if you're going to give me two sticks. Those, those two sticks in one night, back to back. Omar's so sitting there thinking, if you... Of, you know, we'll, 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 we'll see what the interpretation of this Vitola and, but, you know, the concept of the firecracker, it's supposed to be, you know, short and have a bit of a, 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 a spiciness to it, a bit more of a, a pepper spice bite to it being a firecracker. And um, it'd just be interesting to see two different companies uh, take on that that concept. Well, look, this is going to be uh, that's going to be a, a fun cigar, a fun night when that night finally comes. Two of those back to back. That'll be at least a two hour show, if not a two and a half hour show by the time we're done with the second one of those. Um, but gentlemen, thank you once again for a great night, Ben. I'm sorry, but we're going to have to talk about infrastructure and data analytics. At another time, uh, it sounds like a very exciting subject. I'm sure everyone is salivating at the thought of talking about data analytics. Uh, I can think of nothing better. Uh, okay. But for the purposes of Cigar Professor, we are done for tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Anyone that does want more information about what we're doing, go and find the Facebook Cigar Professor page, uh, and that's where we're going to be able to, uh, to help you out over there. There's very little that we can say publicly. So if you've liked what you've seen tonight and you'd like to get involved, go to the Cigar Professor page on facebook send us a message and uh, we'll be able to hook you up from there omar any last thoughts any last words no i'm really looking forward to that double stuff i can't stop thinking about it man <laughs> sounds good doesn't it uh Dima? look that was a great stick uh definitely i think it's a stick that seasoned smokers will still enjoy and it's it's mild yeah. enough for somebody who's new to it to enjoy as well um you never get let down by that particular blend from Podomo. So that's why we put it in this pack. Yeah. Look, I, I, I give you crap for being a Podomo fanboy, and you deserve it. Uh, but honestly, they are, they are an exceptional manufacturer of cigars. And tonight's cigar was, was proof positive, as if any was needed, uh, is proof positive of that. So thank you so much for being our cigar professor in charge of finding and procuring our, uh, our packs. And uh, look, we have next week, we have another Prodomo, uh, not next month, excuse me, we have another Prodomo uh, that I'm very much looking forward to, but that's a topic for another day. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, and that is it for The Cigar Professor for this month. We'll see you next month. See you next month. See you next month. <laughs>